So Sam, we're, we're gonna we're gonna interview uh, Jim Shaw Ten, and he um, was serving in the Navy and then in the A Camp in Special Forces. Uh, he was with Matt B. Sog, Para Rescue Man. Uh, you know, he's lived a, a wild and crazy life, um, and uh, he's quite a special human being, full of positivity. Um, loved every moment since I met him a few years ago. Uh, he's, he's always got a new story, um, and, and we've captured quite a few here. Yeah, I mean, getting to talk to him is, has been pretty amazing. I don't think I've met anybody in my life who has lived a life like he has. I mean, to, to go through all he has and then dedicate his life to service and, and uh, you know, just be, for lack of better terms, a professional badass. <laughs> he's, uh, he's quite the person and what an honor to get to talk to him. You know, I think you were saying the other day about how uh, Tom Cruise, you know, could try to play his life in, in yes. cinema. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I think that's, <laughs> he's he's right on those, uh, on that level and even higher since he's ran all the SOG and A-Team missions and everything. Yeah, he's done it all. And, and, um, and, and on that, I mean, when a bit later in the day in the project, I, I even developed the temporary duty mission um, in honor of Jim's work in the A camps, you know, as an introduction to Cherry's joining, joining the, 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 the game and looking for um, their first experience and in going into combat. And you've got Wild Carrot with you all the way through it, uh, telling you what to do and cracking jokes and, and absolutely. Yeah, yeah. He's perfect for that. So we're here with Jim Shorten Jr., um, uh, former 1-0 RT Delaware, and also briefly on our RT Illinois uh, in, in MACV SOG. Um, Jim's been helping us with our video game, uh, Armour 3 SOG Prairie Fire, which is due out soon. Uh, and also with us is, is Sam, who um, actually plays you in the game. So oh. <laughs> the, the script, the script that we wrote and that you helped edit with us um, for the missions uh, has been Sam's job to bring that to life as a, one of our voice actors. It's been a great honor. It's <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> He's about three octaves deeper than you. <laughs> yeah, my voice is pretty, pretty, pretty low. I guess high, very high. Yeah. We changed it a little bit, so it it sounds pretty pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and he, he I think he did a good job of capturing your character in the uh, in the script, Excellent. Jim. So but you'll get to see that for yourself. So um, yeah, we're going to ask you some questions today, um, and uh, so um, about your experiences in Vietnam um, for the for the uh, people watching. Um, they'll be interested in, in uh, you know, in what our game's about and in uh, your experiences and, and how we've created those experiences in our game. Um, so we have lots of um, lots of time put in over the over the last year and a half, two years. We've been immersing ourselves in in the experiences uh, of you, SOG veterans, and, and some of the extraordinary things you did. Um, but um, before you went anywhere near SOG, of course, you, you were a Navy guy, and that's um, what, what Sam wants to uh, ask you about. So we're kind of talking about before you you went into the A-team. So you, you started off in the Navy, right? Yes. 1964? Mm -hmm. I joined the Navy in June of 64. And all the way kind of from what I've read, went from Navy to Army and to the Air Force. Right. Went from the Navy, the Army, Special Ops, and Air Force. That's that's pretty impressive. That's awesome. So how did you uh how did you end up in A502? Um and A502? Mm -hmm. Oh A502 is an A team. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so what I did is um uh I volunteered, you know, as soon as I when I came back from the Navy, I spent 22 months in Da Nang, Vietnam with the Navy, you know, working on shores and stuff. And I was driving trucks and splicing cables for Mike boats, you boats, stuff, sort of thing. And from there, uh, what I did is when I came back home, um, also when I was there, I learned how to speak Vietnamese. So then when I went back home, uh, I got tired of all the hippies and that sort of thing that was going on in the country. And I 
I just said, you know, I'm just going to go back again. So I went ahead and joined the army and, um, and joined special forces. Um, uh, I took my battery test as a civilian, so they had no choice but to send me to special forces. And, um, if I failed special forces, they would have sent me probably to the 82nd airborne or something like that. Mm -hmm. at 23rd. So, but when I finished my training in special force, I almost didn't make it. I, I, they put me through communications and, um, I had a hard time with the Morse code stuff. So then they went ahead and I said, put me in engineers because I worked with the Seabees in the Navy and they did. And um, so from there I went to Vietnam. And after finishing the combat orientation course, um, I went ahead and volunteered to go to, uh, I wanted to go to Da Nang, but then I changed and said, you know, I'd like to go to A502. Um, uh, which is the largest A team in the world. It's uh, it, most A teams had 12 guys on it back then, and A502 had uh, about 50 plus guys on it. And what it was, if you Natrang was the headquarters for Fifth Special Forces, and the um, all the outlying areas out there around the camp had little outposts, and they were all part of A502. So they had one American on each outpost. A couple outposts had two guys, um, but they put one American out there. And um, they were in charge of CIDG, you know, um, what, what's CIDG? Civilian Irregular Defense Group. And uh, I had company 554. Um, and so I was way out on the other, top, other side of the mountains from um, Natrang. And uh, it's quite a ways out. So I went ahead and I was getting hit with the enemy about every day and a half. So I was getting really used to fighting with the enemy and, and that sort of thing, getting hit with mortars and whatever. And so from there, uh, the team turned over to regional popular forces. And um, from when it did, I volunteered to go to CNC. And they sent me to CCC up in Kantum. And uh, that's, how, that's how I got there, to Kantum. What was, uh, what was life like at uh, Sui Du? Is, is that how you say it? Sui Yao. Sui Yao. Okay, yeah, it looks like it. Sui Dao, but it's Sui Yao. Okay, we were. I was trying to figure out how to say that. Sui Yao, got it. What was life like at uh, at the A camp there? Well, um, I hardly stayed at the A camp at the main camp. Um, I stayed there at Sui Yao my whole time, and um, on my days off, which was Monday, they would send another group down. They'd send two Americans down, and they would take my place. Um, and so from there, they came down the jeep, and then I took the jeep, and I would drive to Natrang take it over to headquarters and park it and then catch a, a you know, a little uh, Ciclo or something like that. And they'd take me on downtown and I'd go meet up with my girlfriend and, and I would just spend the night. We would go to a movie, maybe get a bite to eat and then go back to her place. And then the next day I'd take a Ciclo back to, uh, you know, to the main camp and, you know, the headquarters, pick up the Jeep and then drive back to A502. Wow. So you're living like two different kind of parallel lives at the same time. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, uh, when you're in special forces, you can do a lot of things. I mean, like when SOG, when I was in SOG, you know, you get, uh, you can, if you can stay five days on the ground, you can, you, you can go any place in the free world for five days. Every day on the ground, you get a day off. That's, so that's how that worked, you know, so it was kind of cool. Wow. That's, that's awesome. That's, uh, I, I mean, I always hear about, um, I have another, uh, pretty much like an uncle to me who, who did some time on A teams. I might ask you about him after this, but uh, he's always talks about that, you know, going back into town for, for a day or two and just living life kind of like normal. And that's, that's just wild to me that, that that's kind of how it worked. That's great. So what it's kinds of missions time. did you do on the, on the A team? Uh, on the A team, we mainly just did, um, you know, just just doing recon, just checking around. Mm -hmm. and it, you try to get in contact with the enemy and um, try to draw them out, and then you go after them. Uh, I, I mean, it, it was pretty, you know, to me, running missions in Vietnam wasn't that hard. It really wasn't. Uh, you just hope you don't run into like a, a company size or something of that nature. But, but usually, I ran into maybe five, six, seven guys, you know, or something like that. Um, one time, one time I, I ran into a 
oh heck, probably about 10, 15 guys. I don't know. And we captured about, I think we captured like seven or eight of them. We captured them and we brought them back. And they, what I did is I was up there trying, there was a hospital up there and I wanted to find out where it was. Um, so I went up there and I captured these good dudes and one was a nurse and um, a couple others were aides and then the rest were just local indigenous people that were siding with the enemy, you know, like Viet Cong and stuff. So, but the missions were, they weren't that bad. They really weren't, you know, because I mean, I got to the point where I could smell the enemy, you know, they're, they're, they'd put charcoal on their face or something and, but you can smell it. You can smell the charcoal. It smelled like, like a wet, you know, like when you build a campfire and you throw water on it and how you get that smell of the charcoal from the burnt wood. Mm. It smells a little bit like that. Um, I'd go through and I'd catch, um, I'd see an area where there was grass. Then all of a sudden I see the grass coming back up slowly. And so uh, that was a hint that they were there watching us and they were moving on. Um, they set up, a, I remember on, on that mission, we walked up, we did a, like a, what do you call it? Um, um, when you walk back and forth up the hill like that, um, and when we did that, um, they had a mindset and they blew a claymore. And we had a, guy, a couple of guys get hit with it. They were all, they lived, but they got hit with a few of the ball bearings and stuff. Uh, but other than that, no, the, the missions at A502 weren't that bad for me. The good thing was I learned how to call an aircraft. I learned how to uh, take care of the team and how to maneuver the team and uh, call in airstrikes and that kind of thing. Some, a few times I called in, uh, you know, heavy gunships, you know, like um, uh, Spooky, uh, Shadow, Spectra. I'd call those guys in every once in a while and they'd, they'd work up an area for me. Thank you. Yeah, that's 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 really, really cool to hear about. I never really thought about that. You know, I've heard people say that before that you could you could smell the enemy, but I never pictured it being something like, you know, the charcoal type smell. That's really cool to hear that. Yeah, they 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 put water in it and they put it on their face and everything, especially the sappers. Okay. Uh, their techniques. For camouflage or for Well, yeah, mainly for camouflage in case you you know their faces might be too a little bit too bright. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, a lot of things like in Vietnam, um I had one mission one time where I went ahead and um uh we got into a contact. And that's the first time I got wounded, but anyway, it was kind of funny. But um uh, we ran into a contact and we broke up, broke up the contact. They left. Uh, I don't know if we hit anybody or not. I think I probably hit somebody, but um, we asked for a resupply and they said, no, just come back in. So we walked out and we walked through a village. But before we got there, what we did is we went fishing with grenades and a, a guy named Sonny Hoffman and I, we jumped in and we scarfed up all the fish and we put them in a rucksack, took everything out of the rucksack, put it in another one. And we just filled the rucksack with fish. So then we went ahead and went into town and we traded all the fish uh, for beer. And so we were sitting there having beer, maybe a little bit of rice. And uh, all of a sudden I see these guys get up and walk out. And these guys, they're wearing kind of black looking pajamas and they're walking out and they're white as a ghost and they're tall, you know? So it was obvious they were Chinese mm. and they were, they were the enemy, but they, they saw us. And as one walked out, he just gave me a real dirty look. And I remember Jim Roush was next to me and he goes, uh, I talked to him. I go, Jim, do you see what I see? He goes, yeah. He goes, uh, that's the enemy. I go, yeah, I agree. <laughs> you know? But they just, they just walked out and left, you know? So there was a day after we got into a battle with them. <laughs> Jesus. And you're there, you know, just, just hanging out in the same place as them. <laughs> oh Yeah. I've gone to, I've gone to, you know, you come down to the hill and you walk when you're getting ready to go to the road and get picked up by trucks or something. I've gone into a little like little cafes. And I remember walking to a cafe one time when they were taking down the enemy flag and then putting up the, you know, the Arizona, putting up the, uh, uh, you know, the, the Vietnamese flag. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. And just, so we uh... asked him what was going on. He goes, well, we don't want to get in trouble with the enemy. So we, we kind of, they come in and drink beer and stuff and then go back out into the jungle again. So what they do is they put their flag up when they're here and then they put our flag up, you know, the Vietnamese flag up when we walk in. So it's kind of funny. <laughs> Just, true, I swear to it. That's all true. So you, uh, you talked a little bit about sappers. I know that they were, they were involved a lot of times <laughs> in, in attacking camps. Um, can you, can you talk a little bit about, um, 
you know, the NBA and their their uh, operations to try and overrun some of the the A camps and stuff, or some of the the various camps that you're on. Well, we used to get like I got intel one time on my little outpost when I was out there. I got some intel saying that they were going to the enemy was going to overrun the camp, and the way they put it, the intel came back as saying the enemy is going to overrun the camp down by the rubber tree plantation. And there was a rubber tree plantation right next to my camp. So I was the only one that had that. And so uh, Tom Kemmer, who was uh, actually the third guy to get a Purple Heart in Vietnam, uh, Tom came down and he, um, he stayed with me that night. And so we stayed there all night sitting outside, you know, all night long. And the friggin' enemy never even came. It was mm-hmm. disappointing. But then... Uh, he went ahead and left and went back. And it was about a week later, they tried to overrun my camp. <laughs> uh. and I'm the only guy there, right? So um, I had a Vietnamese guy there and I'm, I'm telling him, hey, get on the horn and talk to uh, the main camp, tell them we're being overrun. So I got out there and I am shooting, had all the guys shooting all the, um, you know, the, what do they call them, 57 recoilists and all kinds of stuff at these guys and, uh, and the machine guns. <clears throat> and I had food gas out there. So we have popped a whole bunch of flares so we could see him coming through the bushes. And I went ahead and hit the food gas and it scared the dog poo out of the enemy, you know, because the food gas was like, um, it was old, it, it evaporated on me. So all I got was this white smoke and this big flash of light, but it was enough to scare them. They thought it was some secret weapon or something. <laughs> right on left. And so the next day in the morning, we took off and we went out there and um, he circled around and we found I found 60 shipping plugs for the mortar rounds, you know, so they were popping them. So I don't know if, you know, cause sometimes they have them that don't have uh, shipping plugs in them. So, but anyway, so I, I found a bunch of shipping plugs for them and I made a little plaque with it for the date and everything. And I got a little <laughs> elf in, a little shipping plug, a little thing on the bottom. <laughs> That's great. Can you explain the, the food gas? Oh, food gas is, um, it's like, a, it's it's a it's like soap. It's like you put this like if you can melt soap and put it in gasoline, and then uh, you fill that and then you blow that out there. And what that does is the the soap gets kind of sticky, so it sticks on you, and and it's it freaks you out. If you saw one go, if you saw the movie The Green Beret, uh, in that movie they the uh, CVs had food gas out there and they blew it uh, outside the A camp and it blew a wall of fire so that they can get out of the camp. So it's that kind of stuff. But at, when I was actually filling it, I had some Koreans with me, some uh, Korean special forces. I had them on the outpost and they were running missions out into the area. And when I was filling up the food gas and mixing everything, they, uh, uh, this one uh, rock uh, captain, he comes over and he goes, no, you're doing it all wrong. I go, what do you mean I'm doing it all wrong? You're like that. He goes, no, you got to put nails and rocks and you got to put glass and you got to put everything in with it. And I'm going, ah, oh, I said, dude, you're really morbid. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I suppose he was a pretty works. good guy. <laughs> yeah, he was a cool guy. I, I got him um, American jump wings and he got me uh, Korean jump wings and a Korean Ranger badge too. That was, that's, that's great. Cool. That's nice. great. So you got to work with uh, some rock guys too. That's, that's, that's cool. Those guys were amazing. Well, huh? what, they, what they did is they went out because I got intel on it. Um, they go out, they dress up like the enemy you know, because they're Asian Mm. and they go right on out and they walk right in with the enemy and they'll follow the enemy back to camp and then just wipe them out. You know, it's crazy. And I got some intel that there was some guys just outside my camp coming back towards my camp. And uh, I told the main camp, I said, that's okay. Don't, don't do anything. I know who it is. (laughs) So, because they look like the enemy, they dress up like them. And they'd come bebopping in. And I told them, I said, man, you got to be careful. There's some guys out there. If they had a sniffer ship go out there, they'd find those guys and shoot them up, you know? So. Dang. That's, <laughs> I can't imagine doing something like, I mean, I can't imagine doing any of this stuff in the first place, but, uh, you know, going out and, and deliberately well, following them into their camps like that. Wow. Yeah, well, you know, in SOG, we had guys that dressed up like the enemy, mm-hmm. you know, our man dressed up like the enemy. So it gives you that little edge just in case the enemy sees them. They go, huh, is that our guy or their guy? So it kind of works a little bit. Did you, did your name Wild Carrot come about before SOG or was it specifically something you needed for your call sign in SOG? 
Um, well, how I got that, there was a guy named Natalie who was going through the Q course, except it wasn't called a Q course back then when I went for special forces. It was phase one and then MOS and phase two, and then they shipped you out. Um, but um, he was going through the course with us and he was an artist and he drew this wild looking guy, you know, uh, getting shot, you know, it had like a bullet going into his shoulder and he has this uh, like teeth, like a tiger and wild red hair. And then he had a little, on the rifle, it had a little tag on it and it called, he had the wild carrot. And so that name kind of stuck. They used to call me the wild carrot. So when I went to Vietnam, they said, you got to come up with a code name. And I couldn't think of a code name. I said, well, everybody calls me the wild carrot. I says, okay, that's, that's your code name. <laughs> that's how I got it. Do you, do you think the Vietnamese would have been confused if they heard that on the radio? Um, I don't know. I don't know. You know, that's something I do, I do not know the Vietnamese word for carrot. Hmm. But um, yeah, they might have. They might have, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I think they probably I, I, laughed. If they knew what it was, they'd probably be laughing. A wild, a wild vegetable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so you had that, and you needed to specifically come up with it for Sog. Um, and can you tell us, like, what made you join? What, what? I mean, you've already volunteered for the Navy. You volunteered for uh, Special Forces, and then you decided to go and volunteer for Sog. Um, the reason I did is because when you go through training group. You know, you have all the guys saying, yeah, I think I'm going to go to CNC. And uh, what happens is all the instructors say, don't go to CNC. You get killed. Don't go to CNC. And I look at them. I go, well, you know, now I've got no choice. I got to go to CNC and see if I get killed. So, <laughs> so I volunteer for CNC. And that's how that, that's how it came about. And, and, and how to run the toughest missions I could run. You know, I wanted to run the toughest ones. Wild carrot seems like a very fitting call sign then. Yeah, that <laughs> was kind of wild, I guess. And how did the journey start? Did were you you were already in country, so you just had to go and sign up somewhere, I guess. Yeah, they just asked you where you'd like to go, and I just said CNC. And then Gary Stuckey was with me, um, and um, I told Gary, he says, "Hey, where are you going to go?" I says, "I think I'm going to go to CNC." He, he looks at me, goes, "You're going to what?" <laughs> and so. He, I, he says, well, heck, I don't know where I'd go. I might as well go with you. So Gary and I both went up to CCC. And he was with Arkansas, and I was with Delaware. Now, Gary was uh, interesting with Gary is that Gary was, I think, the 173rd Long Range Recon. He, and and um, he was not as qual qualified you know, for Special Forces. But he did such a good job in all these missions and everything. And he was on the A team with us that he had such a great background in special forces that it was about maybe three, four years ago, we got him as Green Beret and gave him his S qualification. And Gary and I talked to each other almost weekly. And I guess uh, Delaware, you, you, you joined Recon Team Delaware. Um, they would have already been in existence with uh, Indi indigenous troops. Um, so you'd have come in as a new guy. And then how did you fit in? Um, well, Dan Stir was my one zero on Delaware when I first went in. And um, when I talked to him, he needed some guys. And uh, I don't know if he lost them on the previous mission or what, but uh, he said, hey, I'd like to make you my one one. So I was the one one, uh, you know, assistant team leader with Dan. And then we had another guy named Gary Harnett that came as the one two. And Gary was killed on his next mission. But um, uh, anyway, we, 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 they were putting us in between a regiment, putting us in to go through a regiment battalion and try and take some, in, try and gather some information. And what happened was they put us in right between them and they let us land and then they tried to capture us. And it was a pretty hellacious mission for about three, four days. It, it, I think it was like three or four days it took before the, the CEO, all he kept saying was break contact, continue mission. So they finally went ahead and said, well, we better get those guys out of there. Because, I mean, we're on a hill, you know, we, you're on the side of a hill and you got trees growing up like this, you know, on, on the hill. And you'd straddle the tree with your legs and you just sleep right there. Because, you know, the enemy's not going to walk on it. So you just sit there and just wait. And the next morning, they were, the enemy was walking down right in the bottom of us, like a bunch of them walking down, you know, bang of six and screaming and yelling. And they had dogs and everything trying to go after us. 
So, but uh, after that, we went ahead to another location and we got on another side of a hill and we said, we got to get out of here. They're coming after us with dogs and everything. So what they did is they, the, uh, they called the choppers in. The choppers went ahead and started on their way in. Uh, uh, Dan, uh, Dan Stir, he blew an abatis on a tree, you know, where the tree is connected still, you can't move it. And so we climbed up the tree and the helicopter was coming over here. So we jumped in and I'm, the, the, I went in with two yards. The yard went in, two yards went in, you know, mountain yards. And then I going in, I'm getting in and the chopper starts taking off and I'm hanging on this friggin' skid, you know? And so uh, I go, man, doesn't anybody see me here? And so the mountain yard's looking down and trying to tell the gunner that looked down. So finally the gunner looks down. I'm like 500 feet off the ground holding onto the skid. And so finally they, the gunner's his eyes get real big and he, he reaches down and he grabs one arm and the mountain yard grabs my other arm and they, and I had to let go. And so they just pulled me up and I, you know, I got inside, but it was crazy. And then the next chopper came and got Dan and the other guys with, you know, with Gary Harned and that got them out. And then when we got the doc toe, Dan just says, you know, I can't do these missions anymore. I mean, he had a lot of missions under his belt and, uh, you know, he was, he was pretty highly decorated and everything. So, but he just said this, that's it. I just can't do this no more. So he, he left uh, the team. And um, so the, I'm walking across the compound and uh, the uh, first sergeant comes over and he goes, Hey Jones, uh, how'd you like to take over uh, Delaware? I go, are you serious? I just ran one mission with him. <laughs> and he goes, well, we think you're ready. And then just, just uh, last, um, the last, uh, special operations reunion. I was talking to Dan about it, and Dan came. He says, "Yeah, I told him that you should take the team." <laughs> so, so uh, I said, "Well, if you think I'm ready, I'll try it." So I took the team, and then uh, Gary went on to RT Pennsylvania, and on his next mission, the whole team was wiped out. So, and so um, I took the team, and I got I got a one one as I got Homer Hungerford. He was an older guy, and a lot of guys didn't want to take him because of his age. But he had all this combat experience. You know, he was with um, uh, the Second World War and then Korea and then, then, then Vietnam. He had seven and a half years of combat experience and before he got to Vietnam. So I was glad to take him. And I asked him, he goes, yeah, I'll run with you. And so I was really glad to have him with me. Very knowledgeable. Um, and what were the in indigenous troops like that you worked with there? Uh, they were great. I had, um, I think I had about 10 guys, 10 guys, something like that, that, that on Delaware. But I only took um, uh, five guys at a time. So I had one interpreter, Tolly, and uh, he ran with us. He, the, the enemy after the United States threw the towel in like they did uh, and gave up on everybody. The, um, what happened was that Tolly got captured and uh, they had him in those re-education camps. He escaped uh, three times, and on the third time, they shot him and killed him. So, but um, yeah, Tolly was a great guy. He was my interpreter, and then I had one guy that was a, a medic, and um, I had a, a zero one, who was, um, you know, he's well known. He he actually ran with CCN for a while. His name was uh, Lul, Yul Yul. And he was a great guy. In fact, it was his brother-in-law that I picked up. I went and got the body out and came back. It was his brother-in-law. But anyway, I had those guys. And then I split the team in the middle. But I had one guy that spoke Vietnamese and Montagnard. And he was also a medic. So what I did is I took him as an interpreter on, on half the missions. So I gave half the time, you know, the team off to let him get a break. And then I took the other half. And, and guys, Montagnards are the best. They're the best soldiers. And is it true that they could uh, just take off and go home and see their family anytime they liked? Uh, well, unless we were getting ready to run a mission, you know, I told them I want them here back in camp the day before the mission. I had one guy that he was, he, he was like a playboy, but he would always come. I mean, we'd be getting ready to get on the helicopter and he'd be running up the road with his pack, you know, trying to get on the helicopter with us. One of those guys. I, fi I think I finally let him go. Yeah, I guess you, you need everyone to be on, on point. Um, yeah, right on top of it, yeah. And, and what were they like in combat? Oh, excellent. Uh, mountain yards are excellent in combat. If you've ever seen that, the one with uh, Cowboy, I don't know if you know uh, Cowboy. Cowboy is just an amazing 
amazing man. Um, but I think he's he's Vietnamese, I believe, not not Montagnard. But uh, he's an amazing guy. And uh, the Montagnards were probably a step above most of the Vietnamese when it came to battle. They were really excellent soldiers. They'd give their life for you. If they saw a bullet coming, they'd jump in front of it and catch it. Yeah, that's the way they were. Yeah, that's outstanding. And um, I guess having those guys with you out, out in the woods, you know, it, it means you, you've got that extra protection in terms of they know the ground and they know the sounds and the smells and the, the tracking and the counter tracking and all that kind of stuff. Well, you know, one of the things I did when I was on the ground is I, you know, you, you walk, you only go a, a few meters and then you stop and you take, you, you listen. So what I would do is I'd sit down by a tree and I just close my eyes and just listen, you know, because if you close your eyes and listen, you can hear a lot better. You can hear streams, you can hear animals, you can hear things, you know, so that's how I work that. I just close my eyes and listen for a few minutes and it worked really well. So did they teach you things like, like tracking and other things or, or were you already equipped from special forces training? Yeah, I was pretty, you know, when I was a young guy and uh, I was raised in Colorado up in the mountains and like, I, cause I left England and came over here uh, with my family, but we lived in Colorado and I used to go hunting a lot. So I learned a lot about tracking and how to stealth, you know, and how to walk through the bushes and um, how to be really quiet. So I learned a lot from from that, uh, just from doing that. And uh, then I learned a lot in special forces, like walking across a trail. I always walked across the trail backwards. And I put the toe down to my heel, make sure my heel was in there good. And then, and walk backwards. Sometimes that would throw some people off. Um, another guy that I learned a lot from was a guy named Moose Monroe. I can't remember Moose's real name, uh, first name, but we called him Moose Monroe. And he, he uh, Moose was a great guy. And when I went through one zero school, I had him for my counterpart. And he, um, he trained, he taught me a lot on all the little equipment that we used, like um, listening devices and that sort of thing, how to lay out the, where to lay the claymores and tricks on the claymores. You don't take your wire straight out and lay your claymore so it'll blow out. What you do is you go out and then you go this way. And then you put the, you, you know, you go out and you go this way and then you put the claymore this way. So when the claymore blows, it blows that way. And the reason for that, I think Tilt will tell you that if somebody comes up, they'll, they're going to follow the wire and either they're going to follow the wire and find the claymore or they're going to find you. So, but they, they take the claymore mine and they turn the claymore mine around. And so then they make noise. And then if you don't do that, what's going to happen is they're going to blow the claymores and you're going to get hit with the with the shrapnel, but um, if they turn it around, then all it does is just go in an opposite direction, kind of like a swastika, except you just reversed it. So then you still don't get hit. That probably saved a few lives. Yeah, and then when you want to set up an ambush, you know, we we'd go out set up an ambush along a trail. We we we'd walk down the trail and then go. Back. We'd walk a little bit down this trail if we knew there was nobody there, because you never want to really walk down trails. But you walk down, you walk up, then you do it, especially if you're being chased. So then you walk back parallel the trail, and then you set up an ambush. So when they're following your tracks down the trail, they're going to be in your killer zone, kill zone. So it's, it's, I, I, there's a name for it. Um, oh, fish hook. Fish hook, yeah, that's it. I keep wanting to say a button hook, but it's a fish hook, yeah. I, I've never heard of, you know, like the deception like that, like walking backwards. That was super cool to, to hear about that. Um, so yeah. what kind of kit did you carry while you were running recon missions? Uh, I carried an indigenous rucksack, you know, just like the Vietnamese had. <clears throat> and um, I had a, I had a harness. I put it like that. I put the, had the H harness and it, and it had straps on it. And then you undo the straps and you bring them under your legs and you hook them up. And that's for the stable rig. It had two clips up here. Uh, but um, I had pads on mine. So I just, I had, I just ran them around because I love coming out on strings and ropes, you know the stable rig. So I just had them on the outside of me and then I just unhooked them and put them under my legs. And because your legs go to sleep when you're flying like 50, 60 miles, 75 miles on those things. So, and then uh, from there, I had my ammo pouches and canteen pouches on my belt. And I had mostly ammo pouches. I carried about 
35 magazines. And then um, on the, uh, I had them on in, in ammo pouches. And then for a water, I had a five gallon, I mean a five gallon, a five quart bladder that I put in my backpack and I ran a little surgical hose. I drilled a hole in the cap and I ran a surgical hose into it down to the bottom. And I ran it over my shoulder right here and just had it hang down. So if I wanted water, I can just take and just sip it like that and put it down again. Um, but the, the indigenous ruck, the only thing I carried in there is I carried grenades in there. I carried a lot of myself too. And um, I, carried, um, I, I carried a little piece of camouflage parachute and um, heck, what else did I carry? Oh, I carried uh, first aid, a lot of medical stuff in there and, and, and some food. But mostly on food, what I carried is five cans of fruit. That was about the main thing I carried when I was on, on SOG missions. Um, when I was on the A team, I used to get indigenous rations and it had rice in there. And I'd put water in the rice in the morning, zip it up so you know, it'd be nice and tight so it wouldn't leak. And I put it in my pocket and by dinner time, it was ready to eat. And that's, how, that's what I did there. But in SOG, I just took five cans of fruit that were uh, from the, um, uh, you know, the, what do you call them, sea rations. They had these little, little cans of fruit and peaches. I would take that and that's all I ate for like five days. If I left, but most of the time, most of my missions only lasted about three, three, four days at the max. Did you, as a one zero, did you carry any special gear for that role? I carried the radio. I carried the radio, and a lot of times I walk point. If it's serious, I would walk point with the radio. Was that the PRC twenty five? Yeah, the Prick twenty five. Okay. Yeah, I know that. We carried a, sometimes we carried what's called a Prick seventy seven, and then a KY thirty eight that one of the other guys would carry. The KY thirty eight or the twenty eight, and and it was there was a gun that you put in there, and you, it's a sh secure sound system, and uh, we'd have to do, it, but it was a pain in the butt to do that, but we would do that if we were going to cat codes and stuff like that. Sometimes, like on road watches, it would help. And that was about it. Okay, so you you did demolitions eighteen Charlie, correct? Uh, no, it was eleven uh, eleven. Um, oh, what is it? It's uh. Yeah, 11, 11 B4S, 11 B4S. See, uh, 18 Charlie is the new designation. Yeah, I, I forget. Yeah, the 18 series, they always talk about those are the special. I'm sorry, 12, 12 B4S, 11 mm -hmm. is uh, weapons, 12 B4S is demolitions. Okay, so what what kind of uh, gear did you carry for, for demolitions? Do you have any specific... Things that well, on those to... missions, I really didn't do a lot of demo work on the missions. Um, that was mostly when I was on the A team and stuff like that. Uh, but I carried Claymore mines. I carried, um, you know, I might carry a block of C4 or something. Um, you know, I carry a lot of time pencils and uh, fuses and stuff like, you know, time fuses. You know, you take the time pencil, you break it, you put it in there, break it, and it, it gives you 10 to 15 minutes, depending on the temperature. And... Um, and you do that. You'd use that like at a Claymore mine if you're being chased. If they figure you're like five minutes behind you, you can break the time pencil, put you know, put it in there, break it, and leave it there. And by hopefully by the time they get there, they it blows. You know that kind of stuff. But no, we didn't. Do, I didn't do a lot of demolitions, like going out to blow things up. I didn't do that on SOG missions. For what about for A camps? For did you do like camp defense yeah. that kind of stuff? Yeah, uh, um, when I was on the A team, what I did is I used to, there used to be, um, the Air Force used to come down with a lot of ordnance. You know, the uh, ordnance guys would come down with old ammo and stuff like that, like HE rounds, Willie Pete rounds, white phosphorus. Um, and they'd bring it down the truck. And as soon as I saw the truck going down the road, I used to get in my, my little truck and I'd race down and I'd pull them off to the side and, and say, hey, I'll, I'll take all your, am all, all your stuff from you. And he goes, well, if you take that, you got to take the ammo too. It's like, I don't want the ammo. You can't blow up ammo. You know, so what you got to do is have a chopper come out. You got to fly out in the water and drop the ammo in the water because you can't blow it up. It just scatters. So um, I took that and what I did is I'd take C4 and I'd put it in the nose of the HE round. And I used to run um, uh, a, a time wire on it and then run the wire all the way up to the camp. And um, I had this board with all these little nails on it. And the top row was the active one. And I hooked it up to a Prick 25 battery. 
So then, then when the enemy was trying to like get behind that tree and try to shoot me or something like that, shoot at the camp from behind a tree for cover. Well, I just took the whole wire and just hit the little nail and boom, there goes a the tree. You know, so I did that kind of stuff. I put it behind rocks. Uh, any place where they had an avenue to come after me or any place they can get behind to protect themselves, I had all that stuff laid out there. And Colonel Ralt heard about it and he found out and he heard that I turned away a ground attack. So he, he came out to the camp with Tom Kemmer and uh, this is a great story, but he came out to the camp and he goes, um, uh, Jones, he goes, uh, what's your rank anyway? And I told him, I said, I'm a spec four. And he hits Tom Cameron in the gut and he goes, he goes, you know, you can't have a spec four out here. It's gotta be a hard five or above. Uh, so what I did is, um, uh, what he did is he told me, he goes, uh, there's a board meeting next week. I want you there. So I go, I go on down to the, I, I taught, went to this Mac B place uh, up the road from me. And I said, man, I got to go to the board and I don't have a uniform to wear. So this captain says, hey, look, I'll let you use my uniform. I'll shine my boots for you and everything. He took his pin on bars off. And so I go to this, I go to the, the board. And so when I'm in there, I'm the first guy to walk in too. I walk in. And I'm going, oh, man, it's the first time I've ever been to a board. And I walk in and he goes, relax, relax. He goes, we're looking at your records. It says you were in the Navy. I go, yes, sir. He goes, um, tell me, what's the difference between a ship and a boat? I go, uh, you know, I had no clue. I go, well, I said, sir, you can put a boat on a ship, but you can't put a ship on a boat. And he goes, huh, that makes sense. And so uh, he goes, OK, you can leave. And I left. <laughs> and so I walk outside. And the guys are going, what they ask you? What'd you ask you? I says, I don't know. I think I failed. They just asked me the difference between a ship and a boat. They go, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, about a month later, all the scores came out. And when the scores came out, I got the highest score in country. <laughs> and they promoted me in operations and intelligence and got me my hard five. So Wow, that's excellent. I lied on because it's getting dark in here. I can see it's starting to pixelate a little. Sure. <laughs> there that that that'd be a lot better perfect perfect so, well that's that's crazy <laughs> in country yeah board. that's just the way it was wow. that's just the way it was it's funny yeah sorry Dang. that's that's yeah it's it's so cool hearing about that because you know the was the the board was was it special forces that ran the board then or was it yes just okay yeah, yeah i figured that it would things. be yeah it was yeah. all in the and on the results and everything it was all special forces. Okay. Okay. Um, so another question, what, so you talked a little bit about some of the guys would wear NBA uniforms, stuff like that. Did you have any, in addition to that, um, uh, camouflage or kind of deception type techniques that you used, um, while in SOG or in the A camps, A teams? Um, on the, on the A teams, no, we, we pretty much stayed, with a U.S. uniform, okay, yeah. um, and I just wore, I just I wore uh, tiger stripes when I was on the A team, and that was pretty much it. They, they only last about a week because every time I went back to the main camp, I just threw them in the trash, took a shower, wrapped the towel around me, walked across the compound to the you know to the S four, and I just got new uh, uh, tiger stripes and just put those on, and then I go downtown. I have breakfast, then go downtown and party. But uh, that was our uniform pretty much on the A-team. Um, in SOG, I had a regular uniform that was sterile. And I took the bottom pockets off your, you know, the regular jungle greens. I took the bottom pockets off. They were big pockets. I put them on the chest. And I took the chest pockets, which were small, and I put them on my sleeves. And there was no pockets from the bottom down. And what I did is I tucked that in my pants. And then I took a cravat and ran it through the belt loops. And I tied that tight. And then I put another cravat around my head to hide my red hair. Um, then we would paint the uniforms with black paint. We just paint to break up the, the, the color a little bit and just broke it up. And that's pretty much the uniform, no metal on the uniform. And I didn't wear anything that had metal. Uh, on the clips and everything that were metal on our body, um, I taped them all with black tape. And then uh, um, my uh, on my canteens, I didn't use any metal canteens. They were plastic. And what you do is you take one canteen and cut the top off and you put that in the bottom of the other canteen. So now you got a cup and a canteen in it. You could do that. 
Um, and that was about it. I think in on the A team, you know, I carried um, I carried a regular H harness thing, and I had it hooked with a uh, BAR belt, and I had all my stuff in the BAR belt, and I didn't carry like thirty magazines when I was there either, because um, you can get you can get reinforcement pretty fast. So on there, what I did is I um, I carried maybe eight magazines, ten magazines, something like that, maybe eleven. I don't know. I didn't carry that many magazines. Um, let me see the other thing. Uh, the other thing I did there, there was something else I was going to say. Oh, I'll think of it in a minute. But um, and then for a weapon, I carried the Car 15. Now a couple of times in Sog, when I was a B53, I carried a Swedish K, and one time I carried a um, an Uzi, but the Uzi had a silencer, you know, and uh, the silencer is like twice the size of the friggin' weapon. You ever seen a Uzi silencer? Yeah, no, no, usually it'd be, it'd be, usually be about that big, you know, when it's folded and the silencer would be way out here somewhere. <laughs> wow, that's yeah. a full size Uzi. That's, uh, yeah, yeah it's way, really huge. <laughs> Did you that's... get that, Jim, um, for a particular mission? Was that for something like a prisoner snatch or something or was it? Uh, no, doing... for a prisoner snatch, we used a high standard, 22 high standard with a... Um, with a silencer on it because you don't want to kill the guy but what you do is you you take a good shot and you hit him in the gut where it's gonna fold him over and he's gonna be in a lot of pain and then as soon as you hit him you know you're gonna go ahead and take that guy out you're gonna get him out there on ropes even if you have to set him off by himself but you're gonna get that guy out of there and um then they'll they'll go ahead and patch him up so you got to be careful you don't hit him in a vital area Oh, wow, that's that's interesting. I always heard about how uh, Tilt, you know, talks a little bit about his uh, the the strategy of putting two claymores with kind of interlocking fields of, uh, I guess, fire, and then using C four to try and knock somebody unconscious. Did you ever do anything like that? Yeah, I taught that when I, I used to teach POW snatches and uh, or prisoner snatches. And what you do is you put like one or two claymores on each side. And then you have the killing zone. And what you do is you put a concussion grenade there, or you can throw some C4 if they want, but the concussion grenade is probably easier to work with. And then when they go through, you pick out the guy you want. And when he's right into that middle part, then you blow the whole thing and you take out everybody else and pick that guy up and haul him away. I used to pay, I used to play the, uh, the prisoner. I'd be the guy and I'd be out there, you know, they're behind some trees behind me. And I'd be really close to that freaking concussion grenade. And they would blow the whole thing. And man, that would rattle your brain, I swear. But, and then I, I grabbed, you know, they come out and they grab me and they pull me over because they got the chopper on the way kind of thing. So the chopper comes in and they have me and they handcuffed me to the ladder. And I bit the guy in the, in the foot. It was Sonny Hoffman again. I bit him in his foot, in his ankle. And, and he kicked me and knocked me off. And I'm hanging from this freaking handcuff. And he's flying back to... To, to, to the camp, you know, the B-53 camp. So it was like, uh, I, I said, man, man, yeah, that's pretty mean. You kicked me in the head, I'm hanging by the, he goes, well, don't bite me in the ankle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I used to teach all that stuff. I taught, you know, parachuting and that sort of thing too. So did they use a live concussion grenade on you? Yeah, but I wasn't that, I wasn't next to it. No. I was like, I was quite, I was like maybe, 10 feet away or so. And I'm, I'm laying there with my hands over my ears. But, you know, it, it clears the ground next to you. I mean, all you see is you can smell that burn of the, of the blast and, and the ground is clear and you only see these little leaves coming down all around you. And uh, I tell you, I, I never did that again after that. <laughs> it only takes one time to learn. Yeah, I think, I think it was Lynn Black who blew himself up from one... Um, working on how much C4 and how close you could be to it. I've heard of that. Over, and he knocked yeah. himself out on the range on his own. Um, I, I can believe that. And woke up Black's a few a hours cool later. Guy. Yeah, he's a cool guy. That guy, he's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, I, think, I, think, I think he woke up on the range a few hours later, you know, <laughs> dragged his ass back to the, to the infirmary. That's funny. It takes yeah. a special kind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you do a lot of crazy things when you're in SOG and stuff, you know. You, you, 
you do a lot of weird stuff. Yeah, you carried an M3 for a while, a uh, grease gun. Or, I did uh, carry I did carry a grease gun. Uh, it was a no wait, no, I never carried a grease gun. I carried uh, um, I carried a um, a Sten gun, uh, okay. which is very much like a grease gun. But the Sten gun was um, it had a silencer on it. You know, and it's actually really good. They have a little piece of leather. When you have a grease gun, it makes an excellent silent weapon. But you got to put a little piece of leather on the uh, where the bolt slits, hits the bolt, hits the, the housing like that. So you get rid of that noise, but not so thick that it won't lo load it in properly. But um, yeah, that Sten gun, I mean, you pull the trigger and it's like, doof, 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 doof. I mean, it's quiet. I mean, it's almost like you you can pull it and go boom, boom, boom. And you can like, is this thing working? <laughs> you know? It's so quiet, you know, like, is this thing real? <laughs> uh, that's great. And, and um, you're, you, you were also a fan of the RPD, is that right? Yes, I like the RPD. I never carried one, uh, but I like the RPD. Only, they only had a few of them in camp. Uh, um, what's his name? Uh, is it Steve? Not Steve. Um, Ed Wolkoff. Ed Wolkoff carried an RPD. And uh, he went in heavy. He carried probably about six of those magazines, those round magazines that clicked in there. You know, they hold like, I think, I don't know if it's 90 or 70. Can't remember because I know the AK, I think, I think it's 90 and the AK, I think is 70. Yeah, I think, I think the RPD is 100. And then you, your SOG guys sometimes uh, added extra. So you'd have 125 is what I've read. Wow. I never did that. Whatever the capacity was, I lowered it. I lowered it down to make sure there's no double feeds. Right. Yeah, you don't want to load a magazine full because um, it's liable to double feed on you, and then that's that's you don't want that to happen when you're in a battle. And and I think um, I heard. Did you get thirty round mags for your M16s from? from um, yeah, the, for the Car 15, we got a um, uh, Johnny Plaster went ahead and ordered a bunch of them, but he can only order so many, and then they, we had each guy only had one. Um, so I had one for, that was the one I kept in my, in my magazine, in my, you know, in the gun. And then I had the 20 rounders in the pockets and stuff. And then my shirt was being tucked in. So when I, when I dropped it, I just wrote my shirt and then put the other magazine in some guys. And I did this for a while too, is you take the magazines and you, you hook them up. So one's like, like this and the other one's over here. So you can have three magazines. And you flip them upside down. You can put the magazine in, and then as soon as you use that magazine, you pull it out and you put the other magazine in. And then when that one's out, you go over and you put the other magazine in. You can have like three magazines in, you know, taped together. I so guess that, 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 that takes that. away the time needed to to try and get Reach one out of your pouch. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you're always handling it. And Tilt was saying earlier that that the reload on the Car 15 was so much faster than an AK. Yes, because some people try to put the AK magazine straight in, and what you got to do is you got to you got to like if the gun's this way, you got to you got to put it like this and then push it in like that way. It has to have to lock in. Yeah, so a lot of guys trying to fire them, and they put it and they think it's seated and it's not. They they fire, they try to fire it, and the magazine falls out on them. You know. <laughs> Um, that probably would happen to me. Um, so, uh, so what did when you were out fighting the MVA? What do, do, what sort of weapons did you come across that they were using? Was it was it all AKs? Was it was it? Uh, it was mostly AKs, and some of them had Mazen de Gants, um, and, and I guess I'm, I imagine some of the officers might have had or point men might have had RPDs. Um, so yeah, that that sort of thing. That's pretty much it. SKS, those are the three main, but you had the AKs, the SKS, and the RPDs, and um, it's the AKs, and the Mazen de Gant. Usually the old geezers that were like guarding a camp, if they had or something, they would be carrying the Mazen de Gants, which are a nice rifle, but they don't hold very many rounds. And, and, and you guys used a lot of frags. Did the enemy use them against you too? Did they, did they throw them? Yeah, out? they're like... Um, in a couple of places where the I've seen the the grenades that the enemy had, they were made out of like Coke cans and Seven Up cans and stuff, and they had this thing on the that stuck out of the bottom of it, and I guess they had the they pull this thing here on the bottom and then throw them, um, 
heck, I've got pictures of some of those um, from uh, when CCC was overrun. So, uh, but yeah, I don't know. If, I don't think I've ever seen them have any like classic looking grenades. I'm sure they might have, um, but they had a, um, heck, I don't know. Um, they had the, RP, the RPGs, you know, they had the B-40 and the B-41 round. And some of them had boosters on them. The B-41 sometimes would have a booster on the back end. So to get a little bit more distance, they had those. Um, other than that, they had like, um, they had the 122 millimeter rockets and then they had their, uh, they had their mortars, you know, their, their 60s and 80s, or, which is one step above ours. You know, so they can fire our rounds and theirs, but we can't fire theirs and ours, you know, kind of thing. I think we have, what is, what do we have, an 81, 82? Eight, we have 80, 81. Yeah, we had 81 mortar and then they had the 82s. Is, is there one weapon ab above all that was more feared? See, if the enemy had feared or we were afraid of they might have. Uh, yeah, that you were, that, that you, you, your guys might fear. That, oh. I'd say the only thing I really feared was, was the mortar rounds and the rockets. Now, usually out, out in the field, you don't get hit with rockets. But if you're in like dock toe on the launch site, I've been there three or four times when the rockets have come in. And um, I have one that's got a picture. I was getting into a pickup truck, uh, you know, one of their, the uh, three quarter tons. I was getting into it and all of a sudden I heard that <laughs> coming in <clears throat> and I just yelled rocket and I just hit the ground and the rocket landed on the other side of the truck. But when it blew, it didn't blow into a lot of little shrapnel. It came out in a big chunk, like a big chunk of it came. <clears throat> so I wrote on it, um, RT Dela Delaware, bright light. And I put from Russia with love because it had CCCP on it. And then it, uh, I put um, the wild carrot and uh, I might've put something else on it. And Frank Greco, who did the book on the photo history of SOG, he, um, he sent me, he took a picture of it one time when he was up in Docto. I had it hanging on the side of the shed. And he took a picture of it and sent it to me. So it was kind of cool to see that, you know. I went, wow, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen that. I think you sent me that photo. I've seen it. Um, oh, did I? Okay. Yeah, uh, I think if, if you didn't send it, John Plaster might have sent it to me because I know he's got a lot of the old photos. That, that were yeah. Created. We we give our photos out all over the place. So. Yeah. We'll, we'll if you go on my if you go on my Facebook, you can you can have any of the photos. Just take any photos you want. Uh, that's brilliant. Thanks. Yeah, we'll, we'll put some of these on the on our website uh, with a bio, with a biography of you um, from this and with this interview. So um, that's great on the weapons. Um, we were going to have uh, gone to a little bit about team tactics, and that's over to you, Sam. So we talked a little bit about, you know, prisoner snatches. Um, did you, what kind of uh, drills did you practice before going out on a mission for your team? Oh, immediate action drills, INA drills. Um, yeah, well, if we were down for a few days, you know, waiting for a mission, then I would take them up to what's called the, um, the yard range that we had. It was just down the road from Contum. Um, and we'd go down there and we'd practice. But, you know, the guys are so good at doing INA drills that, you know, it gets, you know, they get lackadaisical, you know, they just shoot anything. But I remember one time I said, you know, there was this truck down there and I said, you know, we've got to hit that truck. And uh, I had this little sawed off M79 and I'd have the guys shoot the M79 <clears throat> and they kept missing it. And I told them, I said, here's the deal, guys. These guys, every guy that hits that, I'm going to get you a new pair of pants. And they hit it every friggin' time. <laughs> they was that good. And the same with the uh, shooting the uh, the car 15s or the uh, the uh, um, AKs. They were really good because we had a few guys in the team that carried AKs. So Just needed a little extra motivation, I guess, for the right <laughs> to hit the target. Um, yeah, it's amazing. They're good. So you're talking about there the the indigenous team members, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Did you well, have any other on one side? Am I, aren't I getting a little dark here? Oh yeah. Maybe do you have a light? Maybe you could turn on behind you. Yeah. Let me see what I can do here. The light give you a little better. Let's see. Oh, that should be nice. That should work. 
Oh yeah, that's much better. Uh, that's much awesome. Better. Yeah. <laughs> You're slowly fading into the night. Um, yeah. <laughs> So, did you have anything else that stood out when you were training with the with the indigs that they that they um, did? Um, well, I can't remember. Um, I mean, I just know they were a great bunch of guys, and they worked really hard with you. Um, very dependable. You know, they're very dependable. And they they just did a great job. Um, I can't think of other things. I mean, they would make suggestions. They would make suggestions to me as we were out there walking. They said, you know, we think we, maybe we should go up this way. And because, uh, you know, they, they might have, I says, because they would hear the same thing I have. Like you hear some animals over here, you know, birds or something. And all of a sudden the birds are gone, you know, mm -hmm. and um, you don't know if it's somebody walking through. Because they had little guys, they had, they, they had like two and three man teams walking all over the place over there. And um, uh, what they would do is they'd, they would do things like recon by fire, you know, and just, uh, you know, if they see you, they'll have the shoot over here and then you go this way and then they start shooting over here and then you go this way and then you don't get any, any shooting at all. And the next thing you know, you walk into an ambush. So what we did is anytime you hear anybody shooting or anything like uh, signal rounds or something, you always walk to it. You go right to them. Uh, because it's usually only two or three guys. So what happened like during when you met contacts, you know, your your team tactics, how, you know, with all that practice that you did, was it was your team always able to kind of pull that out and, and well, utilize it? Usually when we got into a battle, like when I was in Laos and stuff and we were getting fired upon, it was uh, it's usually a lot more than just a few guys where it's really hard to break contact. Um, it depends on the situation. Uh, but I had my guy, I didn't have him fire fully automatic. I said, you just fire, you, you just start shooting one, one round at a time, bang, 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 and walk back. And then as soon as you parallel the next guy, he would pick up and go bang, 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 and walk back. As soon as he's banging, you turn around and go to the back of the team in the same position. And if you have to, you do it again all the way through. Uh, but I never fired fully automatic. It was uh, because you're in a position where, you know, if it happens like at um, 10 o'clock in the after, in the morning, you're going to be in trouble because you're not going to get anybody until like uh, five o'clock that night. So you don't want to lose all your ammo just in case you can't get any tech air in there. Because there's a lot of times you can get in trouble and you can't get you can't get a hold of anybody. You know, to come in and get you out. So, but they were really good with that. They were really, really good with the, their A and I and A drills. Um, I had one time where I came across, I don't know if you want, uh, we can wait till we get into a mission and I'll tell you about it. Okay. So when, so when shit really got to the point where, you know, shit's hitting the fan, what, uh, what did you do to bring it back? Okay, or, well, you try to, you just try to get away and then you try to try to regroup, make sure everybody's okay. And then you just go ahead and, uh, and just move out again. And just continue your mission. And if you and if you did have them on the horn, what to, you know, call in tech air and whatnot, or for extraction? Yeah, you can you give them. A, you can give them a location or something like that. Well, you know, you don't want to be extracted unless um, unless you know you're you're in real deep kimchi, uh, you know, because like they say, break contact, continue mission, kind of a thing. So it just depends on who you're and who you're in contact with. Um, I don't know. I've never really had a lot of that kind of a situation with them. Usually I'm hit with like 250, 350 enemy. And that's a little bit different situation. Then you got to get out of there and you, you definitely got guys out over your head. Those are usually bright light missions. So Jim, can, can I ask, um, you know, what, what, I mean, it's probably an obvious one, but what, what was it like to face the NVA in their own backyard? Um, it was, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of different because like if you're in Vietnam and you're out there in a mission and you come across like seven or eight enemy, well, you're superior power. You're going to go after them. And when you're in Laos or Cambodia or North Vietnam for some CCM guys, um, you're going to get into a, you're that seven man team. And now you got this whole world coming after you. 
unless you can get some air power overhead. Um, that's pretty much, that's it. You know, it's, it's like, you know how they feel, you know, you know how the enemy feels, but um, I don't know. I, I don't know how to, how to really explain it. It's like, yeah, there isn't, you don't see a border when you're going across the border. What you're doing is just, you know, you're just going from an area that's less intense to an area that's very intense. And so you gotta be very careful. It's like, you can't just be bopped through. And when you make camp at night, you can't like cook your food, you know, over there, it's totally different. You're gonna be, you're gonna be quiet. You're gonna go in the RON, climb under a bunch of bushes or fallen trees or something. And you're gonna lay there, try to, if you can get into an area where there is some bamboo leaves or something, where if anybody's walking through, you can hear them, but um, they'll have to hear you when you try to go into that area too. So, you know, so um, I don't know how to explain it. It's, um, you just gotta really be careful. You know, you just gotta really know your stuff and be careful and then just go from there. And, and I was going to ask you what, what you felt kept you alive in all of that, but I guess being careful might be the answer. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, um, I think part of it is just luck and uh, knowing your stuff and you got to keep a cool head. You really got to keep a cool head, you know? So, but that's, that's pretty much it. You just got to keep a really cool head and when, when everything's going down, guys get hit and they start yelling or something, you gotta keep them quiet and you just gotta move on. You just patch them up and you just move on. Um, I haven't been in too many of them like that where you know guys are being shot up around me. Um, I've been where all, like you know four of us got, got shrapnel wounds and stuff like that, but you don't even, you don't even talk about, you don't even, it's like no big deal. You don't worry about it till you get back to camp. But bullets can be a little different, you know, bullets, you know, you get hit in a vital area. Like if they hit you in the gut, you're going to be in trouble. You know, that kind of thing. They hit you in the knee or something or in the leg and break your bone, then you're in trouble. Yeah, I think you did take a bullet in the stomach, didn't you? I'll be honest with you. I took that bullet in the States, not over there. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. How did the VC get to America? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. Some sapper. I don't know. <laughs> He must have been in my baggage. <laughs> but, I, you know, as I had my hands like this, and the bullet went through my arm and into my stomach or into my right side. Okay. Lodged between the liver and gallbladder. So how was, uh, how was air support used by uh, recon teams? Um, oh, well, what, what we usually did is we called, um, we'd call FAC overhead, and FAC would, uh, you know, we'd relay to FAC. FAC would relay and get fast movers in as fast as they could. And um, then you can either talk directly, uh, well, usually you didn't really talk to the fast movers directly, but they can hear you talking. So you'd be talking to FAC, and FAC would go ahead and fire a, a Willie Pete and mark an area, and they would come in and bomb it, unless they didn't have time for that. And then you just give them a, you know, a range and a, and a distance, and then they would come in and hit it that way. Or you can say, hey, on the side of that hill, you know my position on the side of that hill, just go ahead and hit it, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they just as fast as you can get them down there. So you can, you know, one of the problems that we had with some of the enemy is they had this uh, thing where if it's getting too intense, the enemy would get close to you because they knew that you're not going to be dropping bombs on yourself, you know, that kind of thing. So they try to get protected by getting close to you. Smart move on their part. Yeah, Tilt, Tilt talked about that as well. Oh, did he? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So during extraction, you know, once the mission's over and you're getting out of there, you know, did it did it get pretty hot? Did you have to utilize air support to to um, enable yourself to be able to get out of there? Oh yeah, uh, a lot of times I'll have uh, the you know the Cobra gunships because and or if they're Charlie model gunships on the Hueys, I'd have them shooting in the area all around to keep everybody down so the chopper can get in and get us out. And a lot of times I'd have them just drop ropes and come out. Uh, only a couple of missions where I had them drop ladders and we just jumped on the ladder and hooked in and set on the ladder and get out that way. But that, that's miserable riding on a ladder all the way back, you know, cause you, you're sitting on that bar, you know. Um, 
But yeah, uh, I don't know. Are we going to get into any of the missions? Yeah. Okay, so I'll leave some of that for 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 that. Well, well, we can do that now. I mean, let, let's let's ask you. Um, you know, you, do you want to tell us about some of your specific missions? Yeah, we can go over some lighter ones. Um, I had um, I did a I did a couple of road, maybe three road watches or something like that. Um, and what you do is that you you go you stay you get stay away from the road. And you can hear them doing signal shots on the road. They have the they have a three, one round, two rounds, or three rounds signal thing, and they change it around a little bit. I think Johnny Plaster knows a little bit more about that. But you can hear them shooting on the road. So what you do is you go down towards evening and you get down by the road and you just wait for the trucks to go by and you count the trucks going by. And if you're able to, to find out what's inside the trucks. Is it uh, food? Is it weapons? Is it, um, you know, uh, people, troops, and stuff like that? And then uh, early in the morning before it starts getting, you know, when it just starts to get light, then you start moving back up into the hill again. And then at seven in the morning, you send a sit rep and you tell FAC what, um, how many trucks you saw and how, what time roughly and, and how much time between uh, groups of trucks going down, that sort of thing. And usually I, I think uh, one time I counted like seven trucks, one time I counted like 14 trucks, you know, that's that kind of thing. And you do that for like about three days and then eventually they're gonna find out. So one of the things too there is that when you're doing your report and you're talking to FAC up above, uh, FAC doesn't circle over you, they circle off to the side. And a lot of times it's happened to me a few times that when, as soon as FAC leaves, the enemy mortars that area. So you don't want them overhead because then they'd be firing the mortars on you. Um, so those I didn't. Those are pretty good missions. I had a couple of linear recon missions where you go from point A to point B, and uh, I had one one time where you're, you're, we were walking. And all of a sudden, we heard the enemy coming, so we got down, and out of the corner of my eye, I thought they were going to hear my heart beating. But out of the corner of my eye, I looked over and I saw the guys just walking right by me. You know, there's, uh, there was, I think, three, three guys that walked right by us. And we wanted to jump up and take a prisoner. But I was, I was working with another guy at that time. His name was Joe Vandiver. And Joe said, no, because we don't know who's behind that. I said, well, I don't know. I said, it'd be great to take that guy. And, but they, um, sometimes they, seen a, they send a lead element out. And then all of a sudden, you got like a company behind them. So we didn't want to take that guy and try to deal with him and then, give our position away and then have a whole world on top of us. So if it was me, I probably would have just taken it if I was, I wasn't a team leader on that one. I went to help another team out. Yeah, I guess making a decision like that on the fly, that, that you know, you could lose the whole team. And, yeah, and, you gotta be, you gotta be careful. I probably would have tried it and just got the guy and just moved as fast as I could and then stayed quiet and waited, you know, but I don't know. It's hard to say. It's hard to say, you know, and, and uh, after the fact that you, you say, wow, man, I should have done this. I should have done that kind of thing, you know. I had one mission where I, I did a strap hang on the team. The guy lost a man on his previous mission. So I went ahead, the uh, first sergeant came up and he goes, Jones, he says, your team's down, right? And I go, yeah, I gave him a week off. And he goes, uh, how would you like to run with Hill? And I said, sure. What, what's he got going? He goes, well, he's over there and, you know, whatever the team, but I can't remember the team name anymore. But um, I went over and I'm talking with him and, and I go, I hear you need a guy on your team. He goes, yeah, I lost a guy in the last mission. I says, well, I'll go with you. And he goes, really? I said, yeah, I'd love to. And so I said, what's the mission? He goes, oh, they wants to go and knock out a tank. And I go, what? <laughs> knock out a friggin' tank. I said, there's gonna be thousands of people around that tank. So anyway, I did a, a video, re a, a visual recon. I flew over the area and I checked it out. And I picked a couple of spots out. And he agreed on two of the spots. And then there was another spot that we just figured we'll do like a tertiary, whatever we get out there. We figured we'd get on the ground, at least on the second in insert. So we go out there and we're flying and we're coming down in, you know, and we're on the first ship. And then, so we're coming down the ground and all of a sudden, ting, 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 friggin' bullets are flying all over the place, flying through the helicopter or anything. And, and then, and, and we just pulled out of there and he goes, try the secondary. So he takes over the secondary we come on in and ting, 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 ting. I'm going, good Lord. And so um, he, go, he gets up there between the pilots. He goes, put us down over there. 
So we go over there and we're getting closer and closer to the ground. And all of a sudden it's like, ting, 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 ting. And I, all I hear is I'm hit, I'm hit, I'm hit. So I'm, I'm holding on to him because he was standing on the skid and he almost lost it. So I grabbed his arm and I'm holding on to him and the chopper lifts up and got out of there. And that was the end of that mission. So <laughs> it was insane. I walked to the, I saw the first sergeant. I said, next time drop a bomb on it. <laughs> you know. I said, that's crazy. Why put a team in, in de jeopardy like that? Seven man team against thousands of enemy? No, those tanks aren't by themselves. There's not like a little tank crew going down the road. You know, there's a lot of guys around them. So well, then well, I had a mission. if you want, I get into the bright lights if you want that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we, we have a bright light in the game. Um, and it is a tough mission to go in and get a pilot uh, that's that's been downed in a King Bee. Um, oh, a pilot of King Bee. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And, and we go in and get him out. Uh, and yet you have to run about a couple of miles, you know, with, with the guy. Uh, and it's it's a tough one to get out, to get out alive. Well, uh, my first bright light was um, I went in. The guy told you, Yul, um, he had a, his brother-in-law. He was on another team. He got killed. He was coming out on ropes, you know, strings, and, and apparently a bull, something hit the string, I don't know, but the string broke, fell to his death. So uh, that's the one where I went with uh, RT Illinois, because um, Steve Kiever was the one zero and he was on leave and he was due back any time. So um, the first sergeant said, hey, do you mind holding down a bright light stand down up at Doc Toe? And I said, no, I'll go up there. He goes, uh, can you take um, RT Illinois? And I go, yeah, I'll go over there. And I talked over the team and stuff. And there was Predmore was on the team. And there was another guy, I can't remember his name. And then the, the Mott Yards. So I told him, I says, we're going to go up and stand down bright light up at Doc Toe. So we go up there and, um, and we're waiting. And all of a sudden, this mission came through where the guy came, was, fell and was killed. So there was like three, they got, got hit with about 350 enemy or maybe more. and. Uh, they got the team out, but this guy, you know, was killed. So we the, the rope was a tree. And so the one of the ships could see the rope. So we flew in. I, I told them that I said, with that many enemy there, I said, what I want to do is uh, I just want to take three other, two other guys and myself. And, and so that's a three-man team. So we flew in, repelled in as close as we can get to it. And then we walked up the hill and the Cobra gunship says, carrot, follow me. So I, I walk up to the top of the hill and I can see the rope in the tree. So we dug the guy up, brought the choppers back and the ropes were repelled in on, they dropped them. So we hooked up the dead guy, I hook, they hooked me up. I hooked my guys, the other two guys up. And oh, and by the way, Steve Kiever came on that mission. I'll, I'll get that after I'm done. Uh, but anyway, we come up at it through the trees and we could see the enemy coming, you know, like, the, the pilot said there was roughly around 350 enemy coming after us. So we're getting up through the trees and the chopper's taking hits, but they weren't shooting at us yet. So we got up above the trees and then you can hear the bullets whizzing around us, you know, and you can see the enemy down there shooting at us, but they're whizzing around us, but none of us got hit. So then uh, as I got up, we must've been maybe 300 feet off the ground, uh, maybe a little, maybe 400 feet. And the same when he Sky Raider flew down, he just flies down like this. And he just, um, he looks up at me like that. He's like 50 feet below me. And he just looks up at me and he goes like this, you know? And so I just kind of waved to him, you know? And so we got on back again. I can just picture the guy, you know? So that's the carrot. <laughs> so, but because I didn't, I didn't have a bandana on my hair. I take it off when I'm on the strings because it blows off. So anyway, we got back and, and we got back to Doc Toe and, we, and um, then um, Yul told me it was his brother-in-law and he gave me a, a yard bracelet and stuff and said, thank you. So, but um, anyway, that was that one. But what happened at Doc Toe before we went in is uh, Steve Kiever came back from leave and uh, he was on a 30 day leave. So he comes back and he comes, he goes, I go, Steve, what are you doing here? I thought you were on leave. He goes, oh, I just got back. Thought I'd come up and see how you guys are doing. And so I told him, I go, well, we're getting ready to go on a bright light mission. You want to go? And uh, he can't say no, right? He goes, damn, I just got back from leave and now I'm going to go die. 
<laughs> so he goes with us. And then I tell him, it's only going to be two, just you and uh, maybe your one one and myself. We're going to go in. He goes like, what? I says, we have time on target. We don't have time for two choppers. We got to get in and out as fast as possible. Okay. <laughs> but it worked. It worked and it was perfect. So we got back. Then my uh, second bright light was uh, a jump mission. And uh, the guys got, got, you know, got lost and stuff like that, you know, separated. And so we went in and we picked up, I picked up Paul Boyd. Um, he was a, a black guy and he's a great guy. Paul's a great guy. But anyway, they did this jump mission and got separated. So we had to go in, but it was without any incident at all. We just went in and picked them up and came back. And so my, my third bright light mission was um, an F4, an F4 uh, Phantom, uh, yeah, an F4 Phantom. It, it, it was uh, dropping a bomb on a bridge on the Hoochman Trail. And when he, when he came up, um, he caught a 51 caliber bullet in the you know, enemy bullet. In the, and I guess he lost his hydraulics. But he hit the first hill and a big ball of fire. He hit the second hill and landed on the third hill. And so the Air Force tried going in. I mean, I was a PJ too, right? So, but the Air Force PJs tried to go in there and they couldn't get on the ground. It's too many enemy. So they decided to wait. And then the, the next day, well, it was no, in the afternoon, they decided, you know, let's see if we can get the team in there. So I, I volunteered. So, and uh, I took RT Delaware. We went in there. I had Homer Hungerford with me. And we go on, we, we, I'm flying over this thing and I'm looking down. I see this bridge. And I see the Ho Chi Minh Trail and I'm going, oh, shit, <laughs> we're going to be in trouble. So anyway, um, I go ahead and because, you know, there's going to be enemy all over that that jet. So anyway, so I go in. We, were, we climbed down ladders on that one because it was not too far high off the ground. And so then the next chopper comes in. And as I'm coming down, bamboo's whipping, hits me in the butt and rips my pants out. So I got a bare butt showing. I didn't wear underwear or socks. So, so that happened, and then I get soot in my eyes from the uh, from the fire, and then the next chopper comes in, and then we sat down, we waited because you know your ears are all plugged, and you're waiting for the sticks to stop dropping so you can listen, and so we go ahead and we start walking down this hill, and we we get towards the second hill, and like right in the saddle right there, and I'm seeing bunkers, and then off to my right I see three enemy. And they got their one guy. I couldn't see if the other guys had weapons or not, but the one guy had a weapon on me. And I told I told my guys, I said, Kom Sung, you know, I don't shoot. And I, I looked at I, I said it loud enough, says, Kom Sung, Kom Sung. And I just took my rifle and went like that. And so they went ahead and left, you know, because I didn't want to give my position that that fast. So I let them go. And then as we went a little bit further. We came across a graveyard with a big communist star over it. And then we come across this big meeting room, like 20 by 20 feet. And it's like, where the heck am I? <laughs> you know, like, what is this? And so I'm starting to see bunkers and stuff. And we start going up the other hill and I can hear traffic on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And so uh, we find a boot with a foot in it and threw that in the rucksack. And we go up a little bit higher on the hill and all of a sudden, um, I'm almost to the crest of that second hill when the the uh, Cobra gunships and stuff were firing uh, their mini guns, just firing like crazy. And it's right over my head and everything's falling down on me from the trees and stuff. And I got on the horn, I go, what's going on? He goes, you got about 350 enemy coming after you. There's six truckloads of them, a bunch of troops behind them and they got two armored cars. And so I go up a little bit further and I look over and I thought I saw what looked like um, a truck park but apparently it was like a little parade field, like a small field. So I figured we must be in an enemy base camp or something. So I go up to the top of the hill and the jet wiped it out. And I can see floor patterns where the jet wiped out the, the you know, the, the hooches. And I look up and the whole, they had all these hooches there and they had all this uh, bamboo woven over the top of the city, tying branches together and everything, except for the path where the jet went through. So, um, I'm going on one side and Homer's on the other side. He's running through trying to grab uh, anything he can find. And we found pith helmets, NVA medals, a uh, bunch of medicinal bottles and cloth and some cloth, you know, uh, bandages and stuff like that. And you take that stuff and, you, and they can tell 
what unit has that. You take it, they send it to Saigon and they can analyze it. And if they find the same type of thing over here, they know it's a unit that's moving that direction. <clears throat> so anyway, um, right about that time, um, the gunships come over, you know, the, the fact comes over and he goes, we got to get you out of there. He goes, you, you're, it's going to get too hot. And um, I told him, um, I, I told him, I said, I'm not to the third hill yet. I could see the jet, but I wasn't there yet. And it was about another 400 meters away from me or so. And, um, and it was a really steep hill going down. And so the enemy was coming up the hill and uh, the gunships are firing like crazy and stuff. And uh, they said, if we don't get you out now, we're gonna have to leave you there and pick you up tomorrow. And I didn't wanna do that. I said, no, that's because they'll, if they, you know they're gonna be coming with thousands of enemy. So I went ahead and uh, I said, okay, get us out of here. Cause I didn't want to leave my yards there. They would have killed Homer or made him talk or something. And they would have killed all the yards. So I, you know, in retrospect, I thought maybe I should stay there and go hide, you know, but no, I had him get out. So they, the first chopper comes in and Homer and, and three guys, uh, two guys get on that, the yards and they take off. And right about that time, the enemy's coming up the hill after us. So right about that time, they start coming through the bushes and we're, there's only four of us left. So we're fighting like crazy and they fired an RPG and it hit on the side and I got hit in the arm, in the chest and uh, I still got some shrapnel on my wrist. Um, and so the yards got hit too, but none of us got hit, it was nothing serious. So anyway, so then the, um, the chopper comes in and what I did is I had the gunships on the side, the Cobras on the side of the gunship and I told him, I said, I want you firing into the woods all the way through and keep that, especially on that one side where the enemy is, you know, where they're coming through those trees. But I knew there was going to be more coming the other direction. So anyway, the, the gunships are firing like crazy. The gunner on the helicopter is shooting like crazy, trying to keep them down. And we're shooting like crazy, trying to get there. And so we jump on the ladder and snap in. And, um, and then I hear this boom like that. And I'm going, oh, no, the chopper just took a B-40 you know, RPG round. And uh, what he did is he hit a tree and he knocked two feet of his rotor off on both uh, both rotors. And he's taking a lot of hits. But anyway, we got up and we got out of there. We started going out <coughs> and we get and got away a little bit. And as we we're getting away, I unhooked and I started climbing up the ladder to get inside and talk to the pilot. <coughs> so um, I look back and I could see the jet and I'm going, damn, I couldn't get back to that. I couldn't get there. And so then the, um, I told the pilot, I says, look down. And he looked down and he says, you see the squares on the ground? He goes, yeah. He goes, it's a friggin' village or something, a base camp. So when I went back to Kantun, I told him everything I was there. The other Cobra, it was, was Cobra 4. Cobra 3 was there. And I told him, I said, there's no way anybody could live through that. So um, anyway, so anyway, that, that was the end of that mission. And then uh, right after that mission, they sent me on down to B-53 to teach. And I taught infill, exfil, and then I taught um, uh, prisoner snatch, that kind of thing. So, but anyway, so if you want me, I can continue on that mission. On 2002, I decided to go back to Cambodia. And so I, I flew over on my own, my own dime. I flew over, I, um, it cost me about 36,000. I took, I bought a bunch of cameras and a bunch of other stuff. So. I got into Phnom Penh and I was talking with uh, what it was called the joint recovery teams back then, um, JATC or something, I can't remember. But um, now it's called DPAA, Defense POWMIA Accounting Agency. So anyway, I talked with them and they said there wasn't enough information to go back. And I'm going, whoa. So one of the guys with them was a, a special forces guy. And he said, uh, he goes, look, if you really want to go, just go. And I go, really, how do you do that? He goes, go to Ban Lung and just work it out from there. So I did. I got maps. Uh, there was a place in uh, uh, Phnom Penh we, that had a room full, full of maps, every map you can think of, of, uh, of Asia. So I went ahead and got some maps and stuff, and I put them all together. I typed them all together and stuff, And because uh, it was like a 100-mile walk. And the um, uh, by Flight, it's like about 70, 75 miles if you're flying in a straight line. But hiking is like 100 miles. So I put the maps together. 
I talked to the hotel guy and I said, you know, I want to go up way up in the, by the tri border. And he goes, why? I goes, you know, I got a bunch of cameras. I want to take pictures and photos and stuff. And I tried to do everything legally, but they said, no, it's too dangerous. We're not going to let anybody go up there. And uh, so finally I met this guy who was a ranger. He was a park ranger, not like a military ranger. And, but it was kind of a military ranger. And, and uh, he was in charge and he was the son of the district chief. So he got five other guys and we all got together and we took trucks to as far as we could. And then we took elephants from there all the way up to a place called Tavang. Now there's a road going up there, but we went up to Tavang. And from there, we took boats up the rivers and got as close as we could, got out. And then we had the hike all the way. And we hiked for about, I don't know, about three days. And I, I said, you know, how much further? And he goes about 80 miles. And I'm going, well, I said, let's go back. I need to exercise. So we went back because I was in my 50s. So I went back and I started running and getting into shape and everything. And I said, let's go, go again. So the next time we went, I went ahead and we made it. We got up there, it took 10 days hiking through rivers, up the hills and around all kinds of garbage and stuff. And we stayed at a couple of villages and uh, we got all the way up to by the tri border. And we spent three days there. And uh, we walked all around. I had a metal detector, but it was ridiculous because there was flechettes and bullets and everything all over the place. So we gave up on that and we looked around. I checked out all the bunkers. I counted over 60 bunker complexes. Um, I found the jet, found rem remnants of it, you know, because Vietnamese come over and they take the metal. So uh, from there, we were there for three days. And on the third day, we got held up by bandits. And they, they, were, they probably would have shot us, except I had the province chief's son with me. So he just told, told the bandits, he goes, you know, you know who I am? He goes, yeah, we know who you are, and blah, blah, blah. So they left. They said, we don't want you here tomorrow. And so the next day, I left. And we, um, one of the guys had to go up and get some rice up in Laos. And so he built a raft, put the rice on the raft and came back down the river on the raft. We split up all the rice between all of us. There was six, seven, eight of us. And um, so then I went ahead and uh, I stayed on the raft. He wanted me to go down the river on the raft. So I went down the river on the raft because we had to cross the river a couple of places. And that was, it was beautiful. I got video of chickens flying across the river and the water was crystal clear. I thought the water was like two or three feet deep. I jumped off the raft because we had to get past a fallen tree. <clears throat> and I went, it was like seven feet deep. It looked crystal clear and tasted really sweet. So we, we finally, finally got down, we hiked down, we got back to Devang. Uh, we all took showers, cleaned up and everything. And uh, then we had to take the, the, the uh, elephants back down. Back then they had, they had an airport there. So I took a flight and went back down to Phnom Penh and I was there for a while. And then I decided I want to go up to Laos. So I went up the Ho Chi Minh Trail into Laos and I did a lot of filming up there. And then on the way back, I hired a North Vietnamese guy to do that. And they were the guys, the woodcutters that cut down all the trees that they're destroying the forest. And there there's genocide going on because they're killing the, um, the Hmong tribes, the Hmong tribes up there, they're killing them so that they don't, they won't be a problem. The government doesn't want them in the cities because they're tribal people and it would just be a, a mess for them. And they're tearing down the forest and killing all the animals and stuff. So they just started doing a genocide and killing all these people, which is really horrible. But um, from there, I went on back down to Phnom Penh and uh, I flew back home. Then in 2017, I think it was, yeah, 2017, DPAA called me and said, we're going to go back to that crash site. Would you like to go? And I said, I'd love to. So they flew me over to Hawaii and we trained for a while, did some rope work and stuff, you know, because they got this stuff where they're on a hill and they're digging up and everything. So we flew over there and we, they, they clear, they set a team in ahead of time, they, and, you know, locals, and they clean out an area for the helicopter to land. So we flew in with the helicopter and I was supposed to be there for two weeks and come back. But then they asked me if I wanted to stay and I said, yeah. So I stayed there for the whole six weeks and we, we did a lot of digging and stuff. Great bunch of guys. DPA is awesome. Those guys are unbelievable when they go in there and they try to get the, the remains and stuff. 
I mean, they're so full of uh, zest, you know, like they, they, the day one, you know, like, you know, you see guys, like, let's go, man, we got to go fast kind of thing. They're like that all the way to the very last day and, and six weeks later, every day is the same way. And um, we found a whole bunch of stuff. I found some uh, bullets from the pistol that one of the pilots had. And uh, I heard that this last time they went back, they found a dog tag and they're over there right now, actually. They're coming back, I think, the end of April, I think. I'm not sure. But uh, they're going to be coming back. And I hope they find something. I don't know. I won't know until I get a hold of the family. They usually tell the family and stuff like that. And the family, I'm in contact with the family. So, And I sent the family parts of the jet also. And um, so I just got to wait and see what, what they come back with this time. But, but it was a great adventure and I got it all on film. So I hope to put something together on a, you know, on a film someplace and sell it. Yeah, I'd love to see it, Jim. I mean, just listening to you t- telling us that, that story, it, it brings across um, the dedication still that you feel to, to return the remains of the pilot that you didn't get 50 years ago. Yeah, but there was no way, there was no way. Um, I look at it, if the pilots were there, they would have died. If they were by, by chance alive, they would have died. Now I know the family got a, uh, they got a letter from somebody in Cambodia saying, I believe uh, you're the sisters of the family of this one pilot. And the pilot, uh, they said that uh, he was in a prison camp and he died in the prison camp. So he probably just lived a short time from all the wounds because I'm sure he had a broken back and everything else. And the other pilot, my guess is um, that he probably died. They were both pilots, even though you got a pilot and an engineer in there, you know, or the gunner or whatever. Uh, but they were both pilots and they went on that mission. And so it was really kind of tragic. But I, I'm really close to the family and we stay, we stay, we stay in touch. We're friends on Facebook and stuff. Um, so um, then I came back and that, that's about it. And um, people think it's amazing that I, I spent that kind of money and stuff, but you know, I'm a radiologist, you know, I'm a doctor. And uh, so, you know, I've, that's only once one month's pay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because I mean, I was working my butt off. Back when I came back, I worked for a few more months. And then I said, I'm out of here. I quit. 276 oh. cases in one day. And I go, that's it. I'm, it's over. I'm done. <laughs> Well, you, you're putting your money into your passion, and that's the best way to be, isn't it? Um, you, you don't need to have a lot of money to, to enjoy life, and you can put it into the things that you care about the most. What an honorable yes. thing. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll be honest with you, you know, um, I went from like 35, 45,000 a month down to 3,500 a month. And when I retired, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. I said it was the best move I ever made, mm. you know, because money's really not everything, you know. If I want more money, I just work, you know, and get it, you know. Mm-hmm. So what I want to do now is, you know, I'm going to be 75 uh, in a couple few months here. Uh, so what I want to do now is I just want to, um, I just want to relax. You know, I want to write my books. I want to write a couple of children's books and then the other books. Then I'll write my life story. And, uh, and that's it. And I'd like to go give lectures too. Mm-hmm. And, you know, but I, when I give a lecture, what I want to do is, I'll go through my life as fast as possible and have them take notes. And then I'll spend an hour, an hour and a half having them ask me questions and I answer it. I think that'd be the easiest way. Yeah, I mean, you got up to a lot of different things after you left, uh, your, after you left Vietnam. Yeah, yeah, I was, um, when I left Vietnam in 71 with the army, I came back and I joined uh, Special Forces Reserves and I was a police officer. And um, I got my private license too, actually when I, in 71 when I came back, my flying license. Uh, they used to let me fly over there. And when I was in the Air Force, they used to let me, I don't know if I should say it, but they used to let me fly uh, the C-130. <laughs> oh, wow. I flew to Alaska and I flew to Hawaii. <laughs> you know, I had, uh, the other guys were with me, but uh, you know, the pilot, the Peter pilot would take turns and they'd go back and they, we were playing cards, you know, they're gambling and stuff. And I'd go up there and I'd fly. It was a lot of fun. C-130 is so touchy. I mean, you know, they got that yoke. You can just barely touch it. And you barely touch it one way or the other. And it goes up 100 feet, down 100 feet. It's crazy. You know, that's why they got that 
auto autopilot on there. Then they say, turn to a heading of so-and-so, he just reached out and turned this knob, you know, and it just does it by itself. <laughs> really kind of cool. And you, are you, um, and you, you were then a para rescue man. Yeah, when I was a Pete, want to touch on some of that too? Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, when I went to, when I was in the underwater operations, I was underwater operations with Special Forces too, and I went to dive school and Key West and stuff. Um, then when I got back, what I did is um, uh, I was teaching foreign weapons, night vision devices, something like that. And the Air Force guys came up one time, the PJs, and I had no clue what a PJ was. So uh, we're teaching these guys, and, uh, and we said, we're going to have some good dinner for you tonight. And then the PJs say, ah, we're cooking dinner. And they whipped out filet mignon and lobster. I'm going, you kidding me? I said, I told my team sergeant, Jimmy Gaston, I go, you know, Jimmy, no, we're going to listen to these guys. We're going to let them cook dinner tonight. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so after that, I went on down and uh, I had a couple of beers with the guys at, uh, in Truckee. <clears throat> and there's a place called um, Bar of America. It's, it used to be the old Bank of America. So we went in there and I'm talking to these guys and I go, what do you guys do anyway? And he told me, I'm going, really? You guys really do all that stuff? He goes, yeah, we do it almost every week. I'm going, really? So I went ahead and uh, on my day off, I went on down and I'm talking to these PJs guys and uh, Al Richmond was the guy there in charge of the section. Back then they had, uh, you know, like e E8s and stuff like that in charge of sections. Now they got captains and everybody in there. But um, anyway, so um, Al Richmond shows me this, this letter. He goes, look at this letter. And I'm looking at this letter. It says, PJs need to learn more combat experience. And I'm going, oh man, I'm, I'm tired of combat. I'm tired of teaching that garbage, you know, <laughs> teaching people how to kill each other. And so he goes, uh, he goes, that's your ticket in right there. I go, well, if I have to. <laughs> So I said, okay. So um, I went back and told my team sergeant, Jimmy Gaston, and he goes, I told him, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to do an inner service transfer because I wasn't obligated. Inner service, inner service transfer, I'm going to go to the, to the 129th pararescue, Aer aerospace rescue recovery service. And he goes, you're going to what? I says, I'm going to go, no, no, you're, you're, you're family. You can't leave. I go, Jimmy, I'm sorry. He says, I'm, I'm bored to death. I want to do something exciting. And he goes, let me show you something. And he shows me my orders for E8, you know, like this. And I go, uh, Jimmy, I guess you know I don't care about rank. You know, I don't care about rank or money or anything. I care about doing the mission. I love the adventure of it, you know? And he goes, well, okay. And he just tears it up. <laughs> so anyway, I went on down to PJs and they, uh, they had me, I was making jumps with them and going diving with them and doing parascuba jumps and all kinds of stuff. And so then they decided to send me to school. So, cause you ha I had to go to the school. So I went, I didn't have to go to the, the jump school or the, um, uh, what do you call it? The uh, uh, scuba school or anything like that. Because uh, I was already trained in all that. Yeah. So they sent me to Kirkland and that's where the, the, uh, the big second phase is, I guess you want to call it phase two. Uh, I went down there and uh, they put me in charge of the section and uh, it was great. I mean, PJ school is really hard. It's, I'll tell you, it's the hardest school in the military. It's, you know, it's harder than SEALs, harder than special forces. It's not as hard as Delta Force, but you can't just say, hey, I want to go try out for Delta. You got to be picked. So, um, uh, but anyway, you know, like I remember one time it got really cold and um, being in charge, it was cold out, it was freezing. And four guys didn't have the proper jacket to wear. So I, I said, what do you got? And they said, all we got is our flight jacket. I go, go get it. So I, they put their flight jackets on with their blues, right? And so I separated the, I had the, my group here and I had these, a, set, a space and then I had the other four guys there. So they were like in uniform, right? And so we're running across and we go to the school and we're standing out there where you have to do our inspection in the morning. And one of the academy walks up to one of the guys and he goes, what are you doing wearing your flight jacket with your blues? Oh, Sergeant Jones said it was okay, sir. <laughs> I'm going, oh. Good Lord, so much for teamwork, you know. He was, I was hoping he'd say something like, you know, oh, is that wrong? Was I not supposed to do that? You know, I didn't know. <laughs> but no, Sergeant Jones said it was no, okay, sir. 
So they walk, you go, okay, he did, did he? So they walk over to me and goes, we want to talk to you in the office. And they dismissed everybody to go to classes. You know, it was big thing was medical. So we're doing all the medical stuff. I go into the office and they ask me, says, do you understand what the uniform? I go, they didn't have their jackets. What am I supposed to do? Let them get pneumonia or something? And he goes, well, here's the deal. Drop. Give us 1,500 push-ups. It took me a day and a half to knock out 1,500 push-ups. <laughs> I did 500 push-ups in the morning. And I tell you what, you can't fill your arms. Your arm, you can't, you can't even pick up a pencil. You know, then we went to lunch. My arm's probably coming back again. I go back and uh, got to do the other 500, you know. And so then I, you know, that's about all I can do. Next morning, I had to go walk in there and I had to do the other 500. And, and the whole time they're reading this, uh, the uniform code of whatever, you know, how to dress you, you know, how to wear your uniform and stuff. And uh, they asked me, he goes, when I got done, he says, get up. So I get up, my arms are hanging, you know. And uh, they said, are you going to pull that stunt again? I said, Sergeant, under the same circumstances, yes, I will. <laughs> he goes, get out of here. So I walk into the classroom and my buddy on the other side that he's going, he's looking at me like this and I'm going, really, really? I get you, you told him, I told you, why couldn't you just say, I didn't know. <laughs> but we're good buddies. We're friends on Facebook still. So that was a good team. So anyway, I go, they bump me, they bump me. They, the Air Force has what's called an Air Force Now film. And it's to promote young guys to get, to stay in the Air Force and they go to better positions and what have you. <clears throat> so anyway, they're doing this Air Force Now film and we were doing scuba jump missions down in Florida. And I jump out of the plane, you know, I, I've got like 500 jumps out of a C-130. I'm jumping out of the plane with full scuba gear on. I get down the water and they go, you hit the door. I go, no, I didn't. No, you hit the door. We can see it, we got binoculars. I go, bull crap, I didn't hit the door. <laughs> He goes, yeah, we're going to have to recycle you. I'm going, what? So, so anyway, they recycled me, and I had to come back the next time. And in the meantime, I find out they're doing an Air Force Now film, and they didn't want a guy with all these ribbons on, uh, all these ribbons on his chest. So <clears throat> it's this side. Yeah, all these ribbons on his chest uh, to be in charge of this Air Force Now film. And that's why they, they made that up and told me I bumped the door. So I came back the next cycle and made the jumps again, and then they – they called me up and, you know, I jumped out of the door. I jumped, yeah, how hard, can, how high can you jump out of a door with over a hundred, like 120, 130 pounds on you? You're not going to be able to jump out that door like way out there, you know? Scuba gear, double tanks and all this other garbage and medical gear and rafts and everything all over you. So I get down the water, they go, whoa, you left that door by 10 feet. I go, oh shit. <laughs> I said, are you serious? I jumped the way I always jumped. You know, so anyway, so uh, anyway, I, from from there, I walked into the classroom. They called me up the front and they gave me my beret and I and they gave me my little paper and, you know, my diploma. And I just said, thanks, I'm gone. <laughs> I just walked out, got in my car and drove back to, to California for the, what, the 129th. But when I was a PJ there, I did a few hoist missions, you know, where you, they go out and you, you drop the hoist and you get on the boat. Um, which is really on the ships and stuff. You got to be careful doing that stuff. Um, one of the things you, you, a lot of people don't realize is that those, when you're flying out like a hundred miles out in the water and um, that rotor picks up a lot of static electricity. And so, in fact, if you look at Hueys and helicopters at night and if they tip their rotor a little bit where you can see them, you can see the static electricity on them. So when you're going out to a ship and it's got a metal deck on it, and there you're coming down this hoist. As soon as you get with like your feet are like six feet away from that deck, you jump off. <laughs> and I had it one time where I, I tried to jump off, but it was right at that split second, it arced from my foot down to the ship. And you can feel your feelings. You're like, oh, <laughs> you know, it, it's a freaky feeling. So, but I had a few hoist missions like that. Um, uh, guys, um, it, uh, one time, one was a guy that was an older guy. He was a merchant marine on the ship and he had all these young people and he didn't fit in. So he was drinking a lot of booze and stuff and taking pills and he fell and hit his head. And so we had to get him back. He had uh, unequal pupils and stuff. So he had a brain damage. So we picked him on the helicopter 
And that was a cool mission because we got to fly underneath the Golden Great, oh, Golden Gate Bridge. And we flew into this old uh, Chrissy Field, I think it's an old army base. And they took them off an ambulance from there. And then uh, had a few other missions, like very similar hoist missions. Um, had a few where we found the boats that were sinking. And uh, I found one at night, the Coast Guard, um, we, get, we were in a C-130 and I had like eagle eyes back then. They used to call me Hawkeye because I had these eyes I could pick guys up. So I found the boat and the, 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 they had the light on, this, on the top of the mast, but the boat was on its side and the mast was going under the water. And as it came up, I could see the light on it. So they came by and uh, we called the Coast Guard in and they had in a chopper, and we, we gave them a direction. They went straight in and they only had enough fuel for one pass. They got the guys, they hoisted them up, put them in and took off. And uh, they gave us, um, well, we did a bunch of st stuff for the Coast Guard. But they went ahead and uh, they, uh, the Coast Guard gave us a, a medal, a ribbon, which was really nice uh, for life-saving life stuff and like meritorious life-saving stuff. And um, then they gave us, the boat that we saved the guys, they gave us a bunch of salmon. They sent it down. So I had, they gave us a bunch of great salmon and stuff. And then I had a couple of jump missions where you go out in the ocean. One was for, um, I was the, I was the um, assistant team leader and John Stevens, well, Johnny Stevens was the team leader. And uh, we flew out about a thousand miles. And uh, I can't remember the name of the ship. It was a, yeah, it was the polar race. So we flew out in the polar race and um, we jumped in and the guy had a inguinal hernia and a bowel, no, he had a ruptured appendix. He had a ruptured appendix. So on that one, we jumped in, you get on a dinghy and the dinghy takes you over to the side of the ship. And then you got to climb up and we had 30 foot seas. It was horrible. You know, and you have to wait because the ship's here and the waves are going like this on the side of the ship. So what you got to do is you get in the dinghy, you got to go as high as you can on that ladder and grab that ladder. And there's a door on the side of the ship, so you climb in there. <clears throat> and I was so sick. I was so friggin' seasick. And Johnny was the same way. Johnny, when he was coming up, he didn't get a high enough wave. So the next wave came up, and the boat came up, and he hit, hit Johnny in the feet and knocked him off the ladder, and he fell into the boat. Thank goodness he did that twice. So thank goodness, because he went in the water. There's no telling what had happened. So... Then we got up to the guy and we got him rigged up. And in the meantime, the helicopters are flying out. They refuel the helicopters uh, about every 300 miles. And so they got out there and uh, they brought down the hoist. We put the guy in, the, we wait for the hoist to spark. And then we go ahead and we put him in a, a Stokes litter in a sleeping bag and we Velcro it closed, put goggles on him, earmuffs on him, bring him up. And then uh, then they bring the ladder back. They bring the, the Stokes, I mean, the, the penetrator back down again. And then Johnny and I get on it and they bring us up and then we take care of the guy. But we had the low level, like a hundred feet off the water all the way to Coos Bay, Oregon. That was the closest point. When we got there, they had all the film crew out there and everything because it was a big deal for that little town. And, uh, but um, we get, they refueled the helicopters at a hundred feet off the water. You know, just insane in 30 foot seas. So, but we got up there and, uh, you know, being PJs, you know, the film crew's out there and we're walking out in our wetsuits, you know, you know, like, you know, <laughs> doing our thing, you know, so it was kind of fun. And uh, so then we, um, we flew on back in the helicopters, it took us a while to get back down to our base, but we did that. Then I had another mission, it was for the Sugar Islander. It's the one that brings the C-N-8 sugar back from Hawaii and it goes into uh, Carquinas Bridge in California in the Bay Area. So that guy had um, uh, a bowel obstruction, had an ingle and a hernia and a bowel obstruction. He couldn't eat and he couldn't take anything down. And he kept vomiting um, bile, you know, bile up. So we, we went ahead and did lavage on him and a bunch of other stuff. We parachuted in on that one. And that was a lot nicer. The seas were very, very, fairly calm. And it was about a thousand miles out. So we flew out. <clears throat> parachuted in, the dinghy picked us up, and we went on over, and um, they, uh, we went up the ladder, got on the ship and everything, and uh, we took care of the guy. We had him, we had to stay with him, 
um, we stayed with him for about three days. And instead of the helicopter picking us up, we stayed on the ship because we were fairly close, we were closer to Hawaii. So we just it took us about two, three days to get in Hawaii. So we went in there and um, the skipper of the ship, he wrote a nice article in the sugar, the CNA Sugar Journal. And so he sent me a copy of it, it's really cool. Angels in Flippers and Wetsuits is the title. <laughs> so we, <clears throat> we did that. And um, there was a, a general that flew into Hawaii. So we went from the big island over to um, Honolulu and the general uh, let us fly back in his jet. So we got in there and we flew back and it was Christmas day. Oh, there's a little more to that story. That's right, it was Christmas, uh, Christmas, I had a big Christmas party. It wasn't Christmas day, it was a big Christmas party that the unit was having. So I went there and, and I chewed the CO, the, the, the guy that flew the, our, our C-130 out there was the Colonel of our base. It was um, Colonel, uh, oh, I can't think of his name, um, uh, Aguar, Colonel Aguar. So he's flying out there and I didn't want to jump with the scuba gear because you know you can get killed jumping with scuba gear and stuff. And he goes, aren't you supposed to be jumping with scuba gear? I'm going, well, you know, those seas are pretty, pretty calm out there. I said, I don't think we really, you know, they're dangerous jumping with scuba gear and stuff. He goes, well, if you're supposed to be jumping with scuba gear, shouldn't you be jumping? I go, sir, I don't tell you how to fly this airplane. Don't you tell me how to jump out of it like that. And then, and I go, oh, and furthermore, I can fly your airplane. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, we, I put the scuba gear on and I jumped out because I figured I'd be all over me if I didn't. So then when I got there, I went to the party. They said, just rent a cart, come down to the party. We go down to the party and I walk in and I see Colonel Aguar and I walk up to him. And I go, sir, I'm sorry. I owe you an apology. For what? I said, for chewing your butt out on the airplane. Ah, don't worry about it. <laughs> so, but him and I were pretty close. I taught him how to scuba dive in Hawaii. So, <laughs> so we were pretty cool. That's so. fantastic. Yeah. I mean, you, you've had such a, a varied life, uh, you know, with, with before, you know, the Navy first and then Vietnam and then SOG and then uh, the power rescue. And you got to work with a, with a space shuttle uh, team as well, didn't you? Oh yeah. I forgot all about that. Yeah. yeah. I was one of the paramedics on Mount, Mount St. Helen when it blew as well. So we went out to Mount St. Helen and we flew out there and uh, I, I designed those um, you know, stable rigs like we use in Vietnam. I designed stable rigs. And so if we were on the ground walking in all that silt and stuff, you know, for the, the ash from the volcano, because uh, the helicopter couldn't get down that far because we'd just get up in the plane and the helicopter. So we go ahead and go in. And if, if we had a problem, they would drop the ropes and we wore those, the, the harness we'd hook up and get out of there. So we didn't have to use them though. But um, yeah, that was amazing. You know, when you look at those pictures of St. Helen, you see all the trees laying down the ground. Those trees are only like 50 feet from where they went down. You know, all that bare area out there, those trees were disintegrated, you know? And if you look at those trees in those pictures, they look like telephone poles because all the branches and the top of the trees were disintegrated at a certain point. Yeah. But from that point closer to the volcano, they just, they were just dissolved. So we were out there looking for um, uh, the sheriff's brother and um, we, we never did find him. We couldn't find any more bodies. We went up there to, to support the Oregon unit because they were working night and day. And so we, we had to help them out. So we went up to do that and um, but they found they found the, a bunch of I can't remember this is the Smith family or something. They found a bunch of people, and they just put them in body bags and brought them back. They suffocated. Um, the, most of them were like in shorts, and they were they just suffocated, you know, from breathing in the ash, which is tragic. So after that mission, uh, uh, John Stevens and I, the guy I made the first jump mission with. Um, you know, we were sitting there talking and said, you know, these guys, are, this special is going to need some PJs. And so we went and talked to our boss, Al Richman. I go, you know, Al, I says, these guys are going to need, this special is going to need some uh, paramedics, you know. And he goes, well, why don't you work on it? I go, okay. So Johnny and I just, we irritated NASA. We just irritated them, <laughs> calling them every day, saying, you know, you guys need some uh, rescue guys in case something happens, you know, and uh, 
we're PJs out of the 129th. And uh, so the day came, they called us back and said, we're getting together at White Sands, New Mexico, if you'd like to go. And I said, yes, we're on our way. Boom. We flew on down there and we worked with the astronauts. It was uh, James Bajan and Anna Fisher and Rhea Seddon. And um, I'd love to meet James Bajan again. Him and I hung out a lot. You know, the other people, we hung out with him because he was a really a cool guy. In fact, when he left the astronaut program, he became um, um, a, uh, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, a flight surgeon. He became a flight surgeon up at the Oregon unit where, where we were helping the other guys. He, he up there. So he was really a cool guy, Jim Bajan. And they're all medical doctors. And he was also an, a, um, a structural, not a structural engineer, but a, um, he worked with um, ejection seats and stuff like that. He helped design them. So, and then uh, I worked mainly with Anna Fisher. She was also an MD. She was the first mother in space. And Rhea Seddon was, she was always asleep. She was always asleep. But Rhea Seddon's really sweet. I saw her uh, uh, about two years ago when they had the Space Fest. She was there signing autographs. And I saw her and I go, you don't remember me, do you? you know, this is a year before I go, you don't remember me, do you? She goes, um, no. I says, you and I worked at um, uh, White Sands together. And she goes, oh. I go, but you were always asleep. <laughs> and, and her husband is Hoot Gibson. And Hoot goes, yep, that's her. She still falls asleep at every lecture. <laughs> so it was kind of funny. And then Anna Fisher, I saw her this last time too. And I gave her a bunch of pictures and uh, that I took. And I said, do you remember this picture? And she goes, no. I go, that's you. You're yelling at me for taking pictures. You told me, says, stop taking pictures and get over here and learn something. <laughs> So, but uh, now she loves those pictures that I took. So, but, but on the space shuttle, we went down, we trained at White Sands, New Mexico. Well, we'd have um, a guy parachute in. Um, no, actually, no. They, 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 if the STS one, two, and three had ejection seats in them, STS four had three astronauts, but there was only two ejection seats. So they decided to disarm the ejection seats on it. So on STS-1, um, that was Engel, that was, um, uh, oh, what's his name? Um, John, John Young and uh, Bob, Bob Crippen. And so um, uh, they were on the radio. So we're in the airplane flying overhead and the 130 and we're talking on the radio and we can hear them. They're saying that you're talking to the astronauts actually. And they're working scenarios around the world at the same time. And so what they're doing is uh, they said, we're going to have to eject. We're going to have to eject. So they eject. So we fly over the area and they have a guy in the ground in a spacesuit and a parachute laying there. So our job is to come in and parachute down in there and take care of this guy. We, uh, you know, when you, when you get a uh, an astronaut out of a, uh, a spacesuit, you got to crack the wrist and take the glove off first. Most people want to open up the face mask and talk to him, but you don't do that. You'll suck his face out, his eyeballs or something. So you got to do the wrist first. And then you treat him and talk to him and all that kind of stuff. So we did all that work. And, uh, and then we went for uh, STS-2, or STS-1 when it landed. Um, I think it landed in um, Edwards Air Force Base. Yeah. So they landed there. And then STS-2 was the same thing. Uh, they landed there. That was Engels and Truly. And then on STS-3, it was, it was um, um, uh, Lausma and Fullerton. I've met Lausma a few times. I haven't met Fullerton yet. Um, but um, that one landed in White Sands, New Mexico uh, because of weather or something. But what happens is the space shell, it's a glider. So when the glider's coming in, if he's too short, they got to eject. But if he's too long and I can't bring it down because it's got air brakes on it, it's a glider. So it'll, it'll, they'll try to sink it down. And if they can get it, okay. But if not, they have to eject. And that, that was a mode eight contingency paramedic. So I would go in and take care of him. So there'd be two of us at a time going in. Sometimes there'll be three of us. Just We have one guy that wants to just head tag along and have fun. So and we, I did a fly, our pilots did a flyby. And I, I sat in the doorway of the C-130 and I took pictures of the 
space shuttle when it landed at, at, at um, Edwards. But um, yeah, I've met Lausma, Jack Lausma. I've met him a few times. And uh, I, now I walk by and he sees me and he goes, oh, there you are, <laughs> like that. And we'll sit and talk for a while and stuff. He's a cool guy. They're all pretty good, cool guys. I met Buzz Aldrin there too and started talking to him. I told him I was a PJ and he's kind of got a big head kind of, but he's a nice guy. Yeah, well, that's that's pretty outstanding, Jim. I mean, you know, it's just great to capture all this and, and for people to be able to see it and, and hear about your life. And you say you're going to put this all in the book? Yeah, yeah, I want to, I'll do a PJ book and put my PJ uh, time in there. Yeah. And um, it'll probably be a small book. Uh, so I was only a PJ for, I think, six or seven years. Mm. And then I got busted up parachuting and I had a hard time running. And the guy said, look, either, you know, you either go to the doctor or we're going to carry you there. So I went to the doc and uh, he said, uh, you ever hurt yourself before? I took x-rays. I go, no. And he goes, I asked him why. He goes, well, you got a bunch of fractures. I go, like, where? He goes, you fractured your T7 vertebrae, your L5 vertebrae, and you sprung your pelvis open. I'm going, really? Oh, wait a minute. I got thrown out of a helicopter in Vietnam about 25, 30 feet, hit the ground. I had neuropraxy. I couldn't feel my legs for like about 45 minutes to an hour. And he goes, yeah, that'll do it. He goes, um, I'm taking you off jump status. I'm going, no, no. So <laughs> they took me off jump status and, and I still parachute by the way. So, so they took me off jump status and um, uh, they, they wanted to, they said, you know, we can put you in another area. You know, you can be a desk jockey or something. And I'm going, no, I says, I'm not a desk jockey kind of guy. You think I'm going to sit there at the desk and watch all the PJs going out and having all this good time? I says, no. He goes, well, you got 20 years and we can give you a medical. And they gave me the medical and I took it, got out. Uh, John Plaster hurt his back in the same way, didn't he? Uh, going out of a helicopter into long, uh, into high um, elephant grass and hit the ground hard and knocked the wind out of him. And that was it. He couldn't run recon anymore after that. And, and then he- That's when he became a fact, a fact uh, writer. Yeah, and flew over 300 missions as a Probably cover writer. writer. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, right. Johnny's a good guy. He asked me to be on his team. Uh, he was coming back from 30-day leave, and I was going on my 30-day leave. And we met at the um, the NCO club at um, the fifth group, the headquarters in uh, Natrang. And he said, you know, Jim, I said, I'd love to have you on my team. And I'm going, you know, I, that's an honor. I said, I'd love to be on your team. Heck, if I was on his team, I could have done that POW snatch he did on that truck. Uh, <laughs> um I told him, I says, I don't think they're going to let me be uh, on your team. I says, you know, because they needed one zeros. They're shorthanded on one zeros. Mm -hmm. We had, um, there was probably about maybe 25 or 20 of us that ran those missions in CCC, you know, guys leaving and coming in. But um, out of that 25 guys, we lost like five guys a week, you know, killed or captured or wounded and had to leave, you know. So it was kind of rough. Mm -hmm. so but um i mean we had whole teams there that never went out in the field never went out in the field because they never had a one zero for them oh okay yeah because a lot of guys don't want to step up to the plate right and you can't blame them it's a big responsibility you know i was talking to tilt and i told him i said you know i'll be honest with you when i got in that chopper and we're flying out and we're heading in getting ready to go in i said i used to question myself you know like what am i doing here I said, this is insane. You know, I'm, I've got these guys' lives in my hand. If I make a mistake, you know, we can all get killed. Um, and Tilt said, he said, you know, we all felt the same way. So. Yeah. I, I, when, Dan, when Dan Sturr told me that he recommended me to be the team, team leader, I'm going, what? <laughs> I thought you were my buddy. And. <laughs> 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 And do you, all, do you all keep in touch today? I mean, uh, was there a time after Vietnam when you, you all lost touch because what you did was so clandestine that you, you couldn't talk about it? So, you know, was well, there a lot of guys that lost touch with each other or, or were you still tight-knit when you got back? Yeah, we're still pretty tight-knit. We still go to the Special Operations Reunion. Um, I, I, I remember I used to hang out with Lynn Moss 
him and I used to go up in those Sierras and go fishing. He lived in the Bay Area. Um, I don't know where he is anymore. I think we've lost touch and I think SOA has lost touch with him. So I don't know. Um, but a lot of the guys, every once in a while, uh, Sonny Hoffman pops up. Sonny was injured in, uh, he joined the reserves in LA in special forces. And apparently uh, he was setting up a charge and a, uh, one of the guys was rolling out the wire and didn't shun it. And what happened is stacked electricity, it blew it up and Sonny lost part of his intestines, an arm and an eye. Um, but he's come out to see me in Tucson here. Uh, he'd drive by with his daughter and um, you know they'd be going dirt bike riding. And I told him, I asked him one time, I said, how do you go dirt bike riding with one arm? How do you shift gears? He just looks at me, he goes, very carefully, very carefully. <laughs> I go, what? <laughs> so that's funny though. But yeah, I, I haven't been able to jump since I had a car accident. Uh, I got T-boned in my little car and it messed me up. It hurt my neck. That's be when I, before when I, I turned my head and I went, ow, ow, you know, cause it's still, it's, it catches in there and it, it, and it hurts. Um, and my low back, I blew my L4 disc. So they're still working on it. They're going to, they're getting ready to do surgery on my low back. So so yeah. I'm hoping it'll take care of it because now you can get nice parachutes. You can get nice canopies. You can come down nice and easy. So I, I still want to go back into skydiving. When I was at B-53, I went through halo there. I did uh, three halo jumps there. Um, I guess they're halo. I, they, they, they call them halo, but I, I don't, I don't think it's halo. Halo is usually around 18,000 and above. Um, my highest jump was 14,000 because of um, uh, the guide glide path for Saigon. They couldn't get clearance to go up any higher. I would have loved to have gone up to 20. You know, when they go up to 20,000, you know, like Cliff Newman and Sammy Hernandez and Melvin Hill did for that first combat jump mission, they go up there, you know, they have an oxygen tank in the middle of the aircraft with little hoses and you just suck on the hose. And then when it's time to go, you just hold your breath and go out at 20,000. And by the time you get down to 13 or something, you can breathe. Wow, ah, so you don't, you don't need to carry oxygen. Yeah, I think they carried oxygen on that jump mission. I don't know. I'd have to ask Cliff that. I really don't know. I read the story, but I can't remember. And Mel, I love Mel. Mel was such a nice guy. Um, he ended up, uh, uh, he blew a blood clot or something from uh, having diabetes. Ended up lo losing his leg and threw a clot and it took his life. Melvin Hill was a cool guy. And... Um, <clears throat> and then uh, Cliff Newman's still going strong. Sammy Hernandez is real quiet, but he's still going really strong. He's a ladies' man. <laughs> he's a great guy. I love Sammy. I interviewed him. I got his interview. I got all the interviews from those guys. I need to. I need to interview Cliff Newman. That'd be good. Great. Yeah, I, I'd. I'd love to see it. Um, yeah. I, I. I wanted. To, I wanted to interview Frank Miller. You know, the Medal of Honor recipient. Uh, Frank and I were on the A team together, A502, and then he went to CCC. But I wanted to interview him, but he only went to that. He went to the um, uh, the special ops reunion one time, and then it was. He said, "I'm so busy right now." I says, "Guys are on top of me all the time." He goes, um, "How about when I come back next year?" I said, "Okay, great." And uh, like four months later, he passed away from pancreatic cancer, like wow. Bobby Howard did. That's a shame. Yeah, great bunch of guys, man. But we all stay in touch. You know, I've got like over 3,800 friends on my Facebook. So, and most of them are PJs and special forces. And, you know, I meet, I hunt for meteorites now. I'm a meteorite hunter. Mm -hmm. and so a lot of them are meteorite guys too. Mm -hmm. Then my high school guys are all on there. So that kind of thing. Wow, that's great. And, and uh, so you've got this big network of friends and you're going to get a big, big network of fans from this video game you're now in. <laughs> oh, I hope so. That'd be cool. That'd be really yeah, cool. I can't, wait. I can't wait to get a copy of it. Yeah. Oh, we'll get you set up if it'll run on your PC. Um, love to have you uh, fly over the fence with us sometime. Yeah. And um, uh, when you have them ready to go, let me know. I want to get four games. I'll, I'll buy them. Because my nephew wants them. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, well, I think I think we should probably wrap it up. Um, we've we've come 
a long way tonight, um, listening to your life uh, from Navy right through to, you know, jumping out of planes into the sea and rescuing people. And, you know, you've given a life of service, uh, Jim. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody watching this is, is feeling, you know, as uh, or as inspired and full of awe uh, as, as me and Sam are. Uh, you know, it was that was great to listen to. Thank you, and I look forward to buying your book when it comes out. Oh, no, you Absolutely. don't. I'll just give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any more questions, Sam? Oh, uh, geez, there's so. I mean, it's just the the breadth of everything that you've done is is just incredible. I mean, I. I'm overwhelmed with information, but I'm just, I'm absolutely in awe. And it's, it's just so fun to listen to you talk about all this stuff. Well, that's awesome. I appreciate it too. And Sam, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm honored that uh, you're going to be uh, doing my part. That's awesome.